He said, but look, you either need to do one of two things. He said, you either need to become an actor or you train as a manager. Came in two days later, handed him a letter, and he went, oh, for fuck, I didn't mean for you to resign. And I was like, well, I'm going to London. And he was like, I'm proud of you. The work ethic is interesting. Yeah. Western performers were treated with very much a, oh no, it's okay, don't worry, that's fine. <laughs> Oh, you messed that? That's all right, don't worry, You're just don't do it, just don't do it yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, Japanese performers were, what the fuck was that? It was like tore into if they yeah. were slightly off. It was a thumb ring with a little spinner in the middle. And he took it off and threw it at me. And I called it in my mouth. And he went, you swallow that and I'm not taking you to A&E. And I went, <laughs> and my face went white and he went, what? And I was like, it's here and it's really hurt. It feels like a lot of casting directors are coming out going, we don't need big Hollywood production style showreels. We just need to be able to see what you can do as raw talent. Yeah. And that then will allow us to see what we can do with you. Yeah, I used to hate auditioning for musical theater. I don't know if it's different now, it probably isn't because it's been that way for years. But I remember going into an audition room and instantly everybody eyeing you up, being like, who are you? What can you do? Mm -hmm. you're, inst you're my competition. None of you are really my competition. It doesn't come down to who's better, it comes down to who is right for the mm. role. My name is Andrei Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What is their journey? What are they actually doing? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is a stage, screen, and musical theater actor and my very good friend, Matthew Knowles. Hello. Look, I have a, a lot of questions. Mm. I have a lot of questions about uh, how you got into acting, uh, why. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Um, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Ooh, that is a, that's a while back, man. That's what I remember. <laughs> Uh, yeah. oh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. One no. thing, one thing that I forgot to say when I introduced you, it's also that you're a vampire and you look ten years younger than you are. Actually, <laughs> yes, it is true. I am immortal. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I for some reason don't age. I'm pretty sure my mum's got a painting of me somewhere that's getting older and older in an attic. Oh, okay. So pretty sure she, a, uh, she sold something to the devil, and uh, <laughs> here I am. Uh, yeah. So. Your childhood, like, mm. what was it like? Was there anything that pushed you towards the, you know, creative path? Yeah, uh, dyscalculia and dyspraxia mainly. Um, <laughs> that, the, you know, me know English, so <laughs> those words are very, very unfamiliar to me. Yeah, so basically, I mean, childhood in general, I had a, I had a good childhood. I had a very, very well put together family. I was very lucky, um, I never wanted for anything. Uh, we weren't well off by any means, but we, you know, we never, we, we weren't destitute. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was me, both my parents and uh, both my younger brothers. I got emotional talking about it then. Mm. My voice just... <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing as well. I, I do like speak like I'm still going through puberty <laughs> 20 years later. It's no, ridiculous. No, no, no. I, th I think you have a very, very nice voice. I, I'm not sure. No, I've heard you singing something. No, did I? Did I? I don't know. I don't know if you have heard me say. I haven't sung really sure. for a while. It's yeah. been it's been a while since I've sang. <laughs> yeah, musical theater actor is a loose thing. I'm I'm, I'm moving away from that now. But uh, yeah, no. Um, so yeah, when I was when I was a lot younger, all my teachers were uh, constantly calling me lazy. Uh, I was not academic in the slightest. Mm. I had no interest in maths or anything like that. I loved English. I loved writing. I loved creative writing and stuff like that. And my teachers were like, yeah, Matt's just, he's just lazy. <laughs> he's lazy, and if he put his mind to it, he'd be great. Oh my God, it's like you're quoting my teachers, to be fair. I've well, heard that. I feel <laughs> like any thing. creative I talk to, they're like, <laughs> same. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until my year five teacher, uh, Mr. Phillips, who said um, that I should be tested for dyscalculia and dyspraxia. So dyscalculia is dyslexia with numbers putting it mm -hmm. kind of on a loose terms but it also affects things like telling the time remembering patterns uh this is why i'm terrible at like tekken 
and Street Fighter because mm. I can't ever remember the combos. I'm just mm. a fucking button masher. Or are you just terrible? Or I'm just terrible. <laughs> you know, plus hand eye coordination with the dyspraxia. That doesn't help. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mate, basically my kind of academic side of my brain just doesn't it does, mm. just doesn't function as well as the creative side. As I was growing up, my parents were very much like, or my mom was very much like, you know, this is, clearly is where Matt is excelling. Mm-hmm. Both my brothers are creative as well. Both can sing, both can act, but they chose academic lives and that kind of uh, what society deems the successful mm-hmm. route, you know, uh, kids, family, dog, house, all the rest of it. And I was like, you know what? Fuck that. <laughs> I'm going to be a 36 year old man living in an attic in yeah. London being an actor. Hell yeah. Like, <laughs> why would you want a normal life, right? Right? That's boring, yeah. man. Making money. Yeah. The, well, this is why I think, I mean, yes, <laughs> there is that. Uh, but I think this is this is probably why I look younger than I am is because I just don't have life stress. No. Like beyond the stress I have. I mean, everybody has life stress, but like. I think so. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I think we do have some life stress, like as actors. I don't know. Oh, 100%. It, it was pretty stressful. Last year, uh, it wasn't really, really, you know, eventful, <laughs> let's say. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so your mom decided that, like, that's what you are excelling at. Yeah. So she really kind of just, uh, she celebrated that, basically. Mm. Um, and I got into an amateur dramatics group, Exit Stage Left, yeah. back where I'm from, a uh, little town called Radstock in mm. between Bath and Bristol. So mining, mining village. Um, and I started that when I was like, I want to say eight. I was young. Uh, and I was, a, I was a sheep in Treasure Island. That was my first role. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think it was one of the main characters in, in Treasure Island. Yeah, everybody knows sure. the sheep yeah, in yeah, Treasure Island. Yeah. Because in right? the end, in the, real one, for it. in the real one, the sheep was kind of like the it was a wolf in the sheep skin. You know? <laughs> and they basically killed everyone, took the treasure, ran away. I don't. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Not many. Yeah, not many people remember that one. But no. uh, yeah, that was my first role was a sheep in Treasure Island. Um, but uh, yeah, th- is that where where you found out like you know what I could be a music theater actor? <laughs> exactly. That was terrible, by the way. <laughs> but yes, exactly that. Uh, and it kind of went from there, to be honest. Um, and I was with that company for, I mean, right the way up until I was about 18, 19, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Every Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning, we'd go along, do a show every six months or so. Um, Maybe even more than that, it was maybe two or three a year. Um, And yeah, and then when it got to kind of school and college, uh, I finished year 10 and uh, which is kind of GCSEs or was GCSEs mm. when I was, I don't know what it is now. It's all different now. There's something like called T levels now. I'm like, what the hell are those? Mm. A levels when I was a kid. It was like, um, and then my, pa- I, I sound like my parents. <laughs> I sound like my parents. I uh, just heard my dad go, oh, they were called O levels when I was a kid. I'm like, oh God, no. Um, but yeah, I finished my GCSEs and went to, you know, parent teacher evening to be like career advice, being like, yeah. well, where do, what do we do with that now? Mm. And uh, my acting teacher at school basically said, don't stay, don't stay on for sixth form because it's not for you. Go to college, mm-hmm. go and study performing arts, mm-hmm. do a vocational course, something that doesn't require lots of writing, doesn't require lots of essays and stuff. Cause again, not my strong point. Yeah. So I did. And I got into Bath college, did performing arts, um, loved it. Then finished that and kind of went, I don't know what to do now. Mm-hmm. Do I go to drama school? Do I not? Mm-hmm. And it was that turning point in my life where I was like, I don't know how to be a professional actor. None of this education prepares you for that. I don't think it does, no. They're like at all. <laughs> so I took two years out um, to travel and live life. Ended up just drinking and partying and living like a bum for two years. That was, <laughs> there's oh. a lot of stories that come from that. Hey, a lot of life lessons that come from out of that as well. What kind of stories? <laughs> Uh, there's one time, uh, so there's this old, there was this bar that was ran by the, and owned by the director of the theatre group that we used to go to. Mm. And so when we hit kind of 18, 
we would uh, go there 7 p.m., leave at 8 in the morning, mm. walk back two miles from this place called the Bearbury Club back to my parents. Mm. I have so many memories of the Bearbury Club. Um, I say it was an old snooker hall. It was like a bar with a snooker hall sort of thing, right in the middle of nowhere. It was like this old shed, like yeah. looked like a scout hall sort of thing. Uh, the walls were yellow with cigarette smoke, and uh, it was one of these really, you know, grimy places. But everybody was so friendly; it was so lovely. And uh, it, we kind of grew up there, really, because uh, our after show parties were there and stuff. But anyway, this one night, me and two friends were there, and my mate had one of these spinning thumb rings. It was a thumb ring with a little spinner in the middle, and he took it off and threw it at me, and I caught it in my mouth. And he went, <laughs> "You swallow that, and I'm not taking you to A and E." And I went. <laughs> And my face went white and he went, what? And I was like, it's here and it really hurts. How how drunk were you? Uh, we've been drinking for about five, six hours at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To the point where they just laughed and I was eyes watering this thumb ring waking his way down my esophagus. And I'm like, oh, oh this is the most painful thing I've ever experienced. It's like how I met your mother in real life. Just <laughs> Legit. Legit. <laughs> so then my other friend who was uh, training to be a nurse at the time decided that he was going to draw in permanent marker the route that this ring would take through my digestive system. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the next day I go to work and I'm like, oh, I don't feel very well. I'm hungover, stomach hurts. Got about halfway through the day and I was working in a restaurant at the time. And I said to my manager, I was like, look, I need to go to a &E. And he was like, why? And I was like, swallowed a thumb ring last night <laughs> and he just looked at me and he was like oh uh, why did you do it just because my friend told me not okay. to okay yeah exactly i was like i laughed and i choked on it and then swallowed it i was like i can't <laughs> it wasn't intentional you know i didn't do it on purpose um so yeah went to any mm -hmm. and i'm i get to the x-ray i explain what's happened and they're like oh, for god's sake i'm like yeah thank you uh they we get to the x-ray room and the, 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 the doctor is like, okay, take your top off. I'm like, okay. Completely forgot I have this <laughs> marker on me still. <laughs> so I take my top off and she's like, okay. And I'm like, oh yeah. Uh, my friend decided to draw the route at which it would travel. And she was like, it's pretty accurate oh, really? actually. And I was like, great. <laughs> I wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty accurate. Um, so then we had the x-ray done and basically the x-ray came back and I had this white ring in my lower intestine. Yeah. Just like facing the camera. And I was <laughs> like, so that's it. She was like, yeah, you're just going to have to pass that through. And I was like, that hurt going in. Yeah. Let alone coming back out. I was like, oh no. <laughs> uh, luckily, I think I got rid of it. It's never turned up in any x-rays, but we never found it. So... <laughs> So you might still have it. I might still Just, have it. Yeah, may, maybe, maybe it's somewhere there. I've got, I've got a, a maybe, decorated sphincter somewhere. It's fine. It. Maybe, maybe. You're such a hard, you know, such a hard working it stomach. Disappeared. <laughs> Ooh, gastric issues. It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if that's what's caused it, or just right. like I've got a dislodged ring somewhere. Okay, that's just one of the stories. Yeah? That's one of many, many, many okay, stories. Like yeah. Maybe we'll have time to come back to more yeah. of them. But, uh, so, and then you were spending a lot of time there. Yeah, went to, I say, then took two years out doing that and then decided, uh, my nan actually messaged me with a newspaper cutting, mm -hmm. as nans do. Mm -hmm. And she was like, there's a drama school that's yeah. opening up near us, Shepton yeah. Mallet, called the Bristol Academy of Performing Arts which does not exist anymore. Uh, and it started in Bristol, then moved to Shepton Mallet. Mm -hmm. Again, small kind of village out in the middle of the countryside, middle of nowhere, but it had a brilliant theater that they uh, turned into a drama school, basically. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned, got in, was told I would be put into the second year because I was older than the first years and stuff, because I'd taken two years out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head teacher was like, I'm confident that you will fit in and you'll be fine. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Put into the first year anyway. I was like, well, this is fine because actually I'd rather do the full three years, get everything I can out of this place mm -hmm. rather than just do two years and be done with it. Um, met some incredible friends, did a lot of, you know, amazing things and learned a lot about myself. And then... But like 
I just want to stay a little bit on that topic. Mm. Like, what kind of like, what did you study? What kind of uh, classes did you have? Uh, right. So this was uh, a, a musical theater course. Mm. So we would start, the typical day would be, you come in, you do two hours of dance in the morning, mm -hmm. be that tap, jazz, ballet, um, or street. None of which I looked good doing. I, I was good at tap but I didn't enjoy it. So therefore I didn't put any effort in, which I do regret now because I, part of me did enjoy it, but uh, I really loved ballet. Yeah. But starting at 26 is not exactly the, uh, you know, the ideal age or whenever it wasn't 26. It was like, yes, I would have been like 21, think, 21 think 20. Think so you want to start like at the, like, Single digit. It's like maybe eight months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make, make eight months old, you can kind of start stretching a little bit. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, there are people out there that do do it professionally and have started late and things uh, just due to how the, the industry has kind of mm. changed over the years. But for me, I was like, yeah, this is never going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoyed it. Then we would do, uh, you'd have like your singing lesson throughout the day. Um, you would do, I'm trying to think. Oh, we'd have, we'd have classes where we would learn... Uh, like sight reading, like you just get a bit, bit of sheet music mm -hmm. with, uh, and we'd be put into our kind of sections. We would do, you know, end of year shows. We'd have uh, there was, oh, we, I, we would when it when it came to doing shows, that was that was when it was most fun because you were working on it from morning till night. Mm -hmm. and it was the same thing, mm -hmm. and you were like, yeah, okay, this is something we can really get into, sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's when I kind of really got into my singing a bit more. Uh, and I was part of a choir called uh, the Academy Singers, who mm -hmm. were a group of 10 to 12 singers from the drama school that would go and do public gigs and concerts and things, mm -hmm. singing musical theater bits and pieces. Uh, and that's how I got into a choir called Vocal Works Gospel Choir, mm -hmm. um, who are, despite the name non-religious, there's very is mixed faith all mm. the rest of it but the music is very just funky soulful anything you can kind of dance to and what have you and that was run by the I, md I, i can't dance to anything <laughs> i'm not allowed <laughs> so i would be i would be departed from the country <laughs> all right. but yeah it's all it's a lot of like funky soulful stuff um be that musical theater be that pop be that gospel mm. be that rock uh, they do a lot of stuff and um Yeah, I was with them for quite a while, and that was run by the musical director from the drama school. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So that was basically your, but it was like more like um, uh, musical theater education, yes. right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was musical theater education. Uh, I left after three years. Then the drama school shut down mm -hmm. a year after I left uh, mm -hmm. through money troubles and what have you. Um, there, I got my... I did get my first agent straight out of drama school. That was... How did you get an agent? What would be your advice to get an agent? Obviously, it's changed a lot since then. This was going back nearly... When would it have been? 2010. Um, so back then, it was you invite everybody to the showcase. You have your little spotlight book of contacts, mm. the little contacts handbook mm. that you'd have to get. Um, and basically, that's how I did it. I just I invited as many people as I could I think three turned up, which is yeah. good <laughs> considering. I think it's a lot. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot. Um, and one of them emailed me straight away and was like, yeah, we'd love to have you in for a chat. And I was like, okay, great, mm. cool. Sounds excellent. Um, it was not the best agent for me, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's where you it start. It's an agent. agent right? It's a first agent. It's a first agent. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and... Yeah, I think nowadays it's, I mean, nowadays it's completely different. My latest agent, again, I was doing a show, I was doing a play, uh, See Between, and so I invited a few agents along. Um, back, I say back in the day, it was invite as many as you can. Yeah. I think the thing that I've learned now is that you need to find people that, are right for you. You need to find an agent that's right for mm. you and you need to be right for your agent. Mm. It's the same as finding a relationship. Yeah. You know, it, it, you need to be able to work together and understand mm. each other and understand mm. how you can help each other to progress yeah. forward. Yeah. There's no, I can't remember who said it, but there's no elevator to success. 
everything's a stairway and you've got to take one step, help the that help the person behind you up to the next one, they'll help you up to that one and you know you, And you, then maybe like John Wick just roll down the stairs all the way down. Yeah. Have you, have you oh, seen that the, was, the last yep, one? Yep. I mean like I loved it, but like that rolled down it was like, oh come on, he now he'll have to go through all of it. All of it again. All all the way up. Oh, come on. But it was yeah. fun. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, sometimes that happens yeah. in life, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the last time I I put out for agents, it, um, yeah, I, I really, really did my research, really looked at who they represent. That's a big thing. No one's going to represent you if you look like somebody else on their books yeah. or if you act like somebody else on their books. Or like if, you, if you're the same kind of casting type. Exactly. If you yeah. match the casting type of anyone on their books, chances are they're not going to represent yeah. you. You yeah. might get away with it, but then you're also looking at a conflict of interest within mm -hmm. the agency and I wouldn't recommend that for yourself, let alone the agent. Of course. Yeah. Um, so do your research, invite, and like if you don't have a uh, showreel, You yeah. maybe have some headshots, but you don't have, like, if you're fresh out of college or whatever. If like you're fresh probably, out of college, like, you're a graduate, chance. which gives you a kind of, it doesn't give you a leg up, but it gives you a different angle to go in. Because yeah. agents know exactly where you are, what yeah. you've done, where you've come from, and your fresh talent. And then you want to invite people to some kind of showcases that you do with yeah. your, like... Uh, When you graduate, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, whereas if you are the other side of it and you are you're not coming out of training, but you're looking for your first agent or whatever. Um, show reels are a great thing. Yeah. It doesn't even need to be a three minute compilation of different shots. You can yeah. have one piece and it can even, I mean, your very first show reel yeah. can literally be monologues or duologues yeah. with friends set up like a, Uh, like an audition yeah. until you've got material to use. The industry's really changed with that now. Mm. It, it feels like a lot of casting directors are coming out going, we don't need big Hollywood production style show reels. We mm. just need to be able to see what you can do as raw talent. Yeah. And that then will allow us to see what we can do with you further that, on. That's uh, what I spoke yesterday about with uh, Scott Hiller, uh, my actor friend as well. Mm. We were recording the episode and we were talking about like, you know, this, the, the, those companies who do the production of like showreel scenes, that's basically their business. Yeah. And how uh, I think it's not worth it. First of all, it's very expensive. Second, like they give you like that you can see, even though if it's quality production, you can see that it was done for the showreel. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. also you can see like it's, they, they, they do like two, three scenes that like two and a half minutes long and you kind of need like 20, 30 seconds of each of the scene. Like you just like over, they overproduce something like that. It's way too long. You don't yeah. need it. You don't need it. Yeah. yeah, and now nowadays, like the cameras on the on the our phones are amazing. Sound on our phones is great. If you if you can buy like separate uh, some like lovelier mic for your phone, that is actually really cheap now. Yeah, you can buy like for know, like 14 pounds. That it, it works perfectly well exactly. for for the case, and you can record like just a self tape style at home, maybe with a friend. You could do like some little scene, or you could right do alone, like a monologue, do, or like yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think I think that's it, that that is enough for most of the casting directors right now and agents as well because they want to see what you can do with like good lighting good sound and picture from the phone is more than enough to show showcase what like what you can do as long as you can be seen and as long as you can be heard yeah that is all they want yeah after that it's kind of out of your hands it's i mean you know, like if you have a good scene from actual film actual like short film yes. or like whatever like if it and if it looks good high quality production of course it's better yeah if you if, if you, you have done have work it, yeah use like it. paying with five seven hundred pounds for like few scenes like that it's like it's very expensive and it doesn't necessarily mean that it will help you out like if, if the like the, those scenes will actually will help you that is something that people don't realize It doesn't matter how much money you spend, how professional your showreel looks, how yeah. great these people are that are producing it for you. It's never going to guarantee you an audition, let yeah. alone a job. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But to be fair, like uh, I would say, uh, when I first tried to get uh, to get an agent, I was sending like a lot of emails, probably like 30, 50 emails, like in the first first batch, and. Uh, one of the mistakes I did, like, as soon as you, you, you know, you Google, like, you know, acting agencies, 
and obviously you get like the, the biggest ones. Yeah. And yeah. if you're just beginning, like probably it's not a good idea to send it the biggest ones. No, I mean, <laughs> you can uh, just for you know just just to get your name out there and face yeah. out there. It's not gonna it's not gonna do any harm to do that. Yeah. But I would never go in expecting. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how, like, what should happen for them, for those, like, huge agencies who represent, like, huge stars to actually mm. say, like, oh, there is something. In it. And obviously, we all want to think, like, there is something in it. There Absolutely. In it, but probably there is. <laughs> but, yeah, that's it. That's uh, but, it. And another thing that I did, like, I only had, like, some, some self-tapes or something like that. Like, I was sending them, and they didn't kind of, like, most of them didn't even come back to me. Yes, uh, yeah. But then as soon as I had, like, one proper scene um, that was shot by a very, very good um, uh, director, uh, James Bush, I don't know if you... Have you ever seen uh, Predator Dark Ages? Uh, yeah, I think I have, yeah. So this is the guy, like, he's a director. Or, like, no he, way! He, like, he directed my first, basically, showreel scene. And the DOP was Richard Oggs, who I'll be recording with uh, next week as well. And so, like, the, the production quality was amazing on this uh, on this scene. As soon as I had it, I had only that scene. I sent it to 15 agencies, and I had three uh, uh, responses. Nice. Three, three offers, which yeah. was like very nice. And then I kind of went with Fiona Cross that we share. Who right we now. share yeah, an agent. Now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you do have a good quality, like high production quality scene, it can really help. It can. But again, it doesn't But it's guarantee. not necessary. It doesn't no. guarantee anything. Yeah. Because it. it's, it's, it's such a potluck as well. You've got to have, it all, it, all the stars need to align, essentially. It's a combination of skill, luck, timing like yeah persistence they like belief <laughs> they they might like they need to the agency that you're turning to they probably will like need to have their books open yeah they need to be looking for someone like your typecast because maybe like maybe they like you but they already have someone as we as we like discussed before exactly so, yeah it's it's uh, there is no guarantee no no but anyway so you got your first agent. So, got my first agent. Yes, yes. Uh, and I won't mention his name, um, but it was uh, an interesting agency. Yeah. Uh, I did get my first job through, and it was fantastic. It was off West End. It was a pantomime. It was in uh, Gray's Theatre in Essex. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. It was not. It was a while back now. <laughs> um, but I played, it was Robin Hood and the Babes in the Woods was the pantomime's name. All right, that, that sounds sounds like uh, something from, 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 from Pornhub. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Where I played Plunkett, the sheriff's henchman, so I was the comedy, basically the mm. comedy relief, uh, which I had so much fun with, because mm. I got to crack out my natural accent and be this West Country imbecile, basically. Mm. Uh, and that was great, and then after that, it kind of dried up. I didn't really do much for a yeah. bit. Um, for how long? How, uh, how old this, were you? So I would have been. I'm. Te this is this is where the dyscalculia kicks in. Yeah. I'm terrible with dates, ages. <laughs> I could tell you it was 2015 and that I was 24, but like, I don't know how old I was when I was in 2015. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> well, just just I don't know. Just say it with you know the whole all the confidence, confidence. and that's it. Like no one, no one will actually sit there like listening to the podcast. Like uh, no, I got a minute. It. <laughs> it doesn't end up. Hmm. <laughs> as long as it's strong and wrong, it's fine. Do it with confidence, and you're okay. Say so right. with a smile, and people will go, oh, yeah, you know what you're talking about. Be very confident. Like if someone asks you, like how big is was the fish? Oh, it was like that. It was like, but I don't think, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so this would have been. I want to say I would have been about 22, 23 mm. maybe. Um, and then after that, I got some interesting auditions. Uh, one of which I turned up to, and they went, "Oh, we didn't know you were coming." And I stood there going. Okay, I have all the info. And they were like, yeah, no, we've been trying to get hold of your agent for the last week or so, and they've not contacted us. So right. we just assumed you weren't coming. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm here. Can I like can I audition? And they were like, Yeah, if you'd like to. They, and it was, they're like it was that response. Yeah, if you'd like to. And I was sure. like, I mean, I will, 
but I feel like I'm probably not going to get the job. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't. Uh, and then the next audition I went to that, that I got sent to, I got told, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to involve a bit of dance, you know, take mm. it. And I was like, cool, all right. So I took my dance pants, my, mm. you know, all the rest of it, the drama school dance gear. Mm-hmm. I rock up to this place and I'm like, there's a lot of men in here wearing leotards mm-hmm. and putting ballet shoes on. And I was like, um, hi. And at this point, I had a, I was under a different name as well. My, my stage name was different at this point. Mm-hmm. So I was like, hi, I'm uh, Matthew Meddings. And they're like, yeah, that's fine. And I was like, I, I'm here for the, the dance call. Mm-hmm. And she went, yeah, the Welsh National Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What? She went, yeah, Welsh National Ballet. It's the only auditions happening today. Yeah. And I was like, must be the one then. She went, yep, your name's down. And I was like, oh, okay. So I walked into the room and there are there are guys with their legs up here. They're, yeah. doing, they're stretching out and I'm like, okay, I can't touch my toes at this point. Let alone, and I was like, all right, yeah, look, I did three years of basic ballet that I loved, but it was all bar work. Like, yeah. they're throwing out French words. So I'm like, what? And this is one of those auditions where they just yell words at you mm. and you know what they're talking about. Yeah. So I'm stood at the back of the room and I just stood there and I watched the first group do it. And I kind of went round the side of the room and I went up to the audition. I was like, I'm really sorry. My agent has sent me to this audition, but I am not a ballet dancer. I have no idea what you're saying. I can tap. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to go if that's okay. And she she just looked at me, bless her. She was like, it's absolutely fine. And I was like, thank you. So I left. (laughs) I can't even she's like, no, dance, bitch, dance, Dance. little monkey, dance. Do it. (laughs) Um, So that was fun. Uh, Then it was like maybe... It was a good while until 2012 when I, oh, so this, yeah, it would have been like, yeah, two years after I got my first job, uh, I, I went for an open audition basically for mm-hmm. uh, TUI to work as an entertainer abroad. So I went along to the audition and got offered a job. And I was like, great, where am I going to go? Like, you've got holiday villages all over the world. And they were like, there's this brand new one just opened up. And I was like, oh my God, in Hull. <laughs> And I was like, wait, Yorkshire? And they were like, yep. They were like, this is your first contract. And I was like, no, I get it. I get it. It's fine. So I was working in a a caravan park in 2012 in Hull, uh, which was great fun, I will admit. You know, you're doing your evening shows, you're doing the kids' entertainment, you're doing the daytime duties, all Mm. the rest of it. We lived in, me and my van mate, Rob, uh, who was the techie, we lived in the worst, most rundown caravan on site. Fun fact, did you know that Hull, one of the greyest, wettest, windiest, coldest cities in England? I haven't heard, I haven't heard about that place ever, <laughs> at all. Yeah, it doesn't surprise <laughs> but, me. But I mean, like, I haven't heard about most places in the world. Yeah, yeah. Because, no. my, yeah, my geography uh, knowledge is not really great, but, you know. <laughs> so, no, I didn't. Well, they make caravans which i oh, they're like the home of caravans or something and i was like hang on wait in the this, world or you can I, like, I guess caravan like, capital of the world I, I don't know if it's the world or if it's just england or what but it was like i got there and i was like wait you you make caravans in yeah. hull and they were like yeah we like that's what we like we're specialized i was like yeah. hang on there's no there's no beaches like here it's like how, what I don't get this. <laughs> Not that you use a caravan on a beach, but I was like, this isn't doesn't feel like a holiday destination. Yeah, anyway. Well, that's well, they try to make it just to feel that's like it. That's it. That's it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I had a great time. It was great fun, and I do love Hull. Would just like to say, do love Hull. The people are great. Um, I I probably I would love it too, but I've never been there, so I'm sorry. Northerners. Uh, how, how long have you been there? So I was there for. It was a six month contract. Uh, and I was there for five months mm. before the caravan park started losing money. And so basically we started doing other duties like cleaning caravans yeah. after people left. And I was like, hang on a minute. And you were like on, on a call with your agent. So you know what? 20% that you're taking of me like that's not like this for acting, right? Not for yeah. cleaning. <laughs> well, this was it. At this point, I didn't know if I had an agent or not because mm. I hadn't heard from him. Um, so they then came in one day and they were like, 
someone has to go. We have to get rid of one of the acting team because we can't afford to keep you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I will. <laughs> everything, everything is clean already. Yeah, I was like, I will, I'll go. I'm like, I hated it at that point. I was like, this is not why I'm here. I'm not here to clean yeah, yeah. So, you know. A week later, the company that were kind of working for TUI that, that did all of this stuff around me and they were like, hey, so we understand you've just been let go of your contract in Hull. And I was like, yep. Yeah. Uh, and I was still, I was working out my last month there basically. And they said, um, we've just had someone leave Egypt, Holiday Village. Mm. Uh, it's notoriously the hardest contract we do because it's eight months, potentially 12, if you want to do the winter as well. Mm-hmm. It's eight months long in Sharm El Sheikh in you know, 50 degree Celsius heat with high humidity or <laughs> low humidity, depending on time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, everything always breaks, but someone's gone home early. Can you go out and help the team? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's go to Egypt. Nice, yeah. So went out to Egypt for three months uh, to just basically assist the team. I didn't have to learn anything because they were doing all their shows and stuff. So they were doing three man shows instead of four man. And I was just with the kids in the audience, like just watching these shows every night. I (laughs) Uh, basically then got asked to help out the adult bar, the adult entertainer, an over 18s bar on site. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, cool. This is great. Uh, And he then asked me to do my own music set which was uh, kind of a, a swing set, which is what I specialized in at the time. Um, a lot of Buble and Rat Pack and Dean Martin and all the rest of it. Uh, and that went down a storm and I loved it. And then came home and they said, hey, do you want to do another contract yet next year? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, great. They were like, cool. Okay, we're going to send you to Lanzarote. I was like, brilliant. Cool. Never been. Would love mm-hmm. to. Volcano. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Uh, then two months before that was due to start, I got a phone call saying, hey, so we've just lost someone from the Egypt contract. You've Mm. already been there. Do you want to go out again? I was like, yes, go on then. Mm. Like, I'd love to spend the whole contract there and actually work the job. Uh, And they were like, cool, it starts in two weeks. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I had like, rather than two months, I had two weeks to get to training and work. But yeah, that was great fun. Did that for, did that for, well, I did that for seven months. Then got sent home early because I was really unwell because of my diabetes and what have you. I just couldn't. It was a mm. nightmare to control in Egypt. Mm. Uh, I had to get people to bring insulin when they were coming, like the fly out mm. acts. And well, when when were you diagnosed with with uh, diabetes? Uh, so I was diagnosed when I was 21. Mm-hmm. So this would have been, I don't know. Again, maths terrible. My brain just kind of shuts down every time I try and do any sort of <laughs> how, mental how, how much did it change your life? Like when when you got massively, yeah. especially at 21. Yeah, yeah, because I just got to drama school. Uh, and I was going out at Pine every weekend, mm-hmm. um, doing physical activity all, during the day. And I had no idea. I had no idea how to control it mm-hmm. whatsoever. Um, and yeah, basically I, I gained loads of weight. I was just under 16 stone at one point, which is a big a lot. Yeah. yeah. I was like twice the size I am now. All like, right. Yeah. 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 Um, I was, yeah. Fat man. Hmm. He was a he was a thing, uh, and <laughs> was he a different person, oh, <laughs> a wilder person? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> probably a bit more reckless. Um, <laughs> in fact, definitely a bit more reckless. Mm. Uh, but yeah, my friend at the time was uh, basically said to me, "Hey, I think you've got you might have diabetes." And I'm mm. like, "What?" He was like, "Yeah, you're peeing all the time. You get cranky whenever we go out. And you don't eat, and you're fine after you eat." I was like, "Okay." That's like, you're constantly thirsty. <laughs> He was like, you're constantly thirsty. It doesn't matter how much you drink and you pee yeah. even if you don't drink anything. Uh, and I was like, okay. He said, also, you're getting fat. And I was like, well, yeah. I was like, you know, at the time, I was like, well, I'm, I'm 18. Yeah. I'm drinking I'm all the growing. time. Yeah. My metabolism's slowing down. I'm not, I've taken a year off and I'm not doing anything. Yeah. So I was like, it makes sense. I told my parents and they were like, nah, you're overreacting. So I went down, got a free blood test down at uh, Lloyd's Pharmacy. And they were like, okay, this is reading off the the chart mm. uh can you come back in the morning after you've done a like a, a fasting over yeah I said yeah cool came in in the morning did it again they went yeah uh, are you able to get to a and e right now and i was like right now i was like yeah i mean my dad's outside I can, that's fine and they're like yeah do that you we don't know how you're standing and i was like oh, okay cool <laughs> so I went into a and e they were like yeah okay your your blood sugar levels are through the roof like uh, mm. we don't know how long they've been like this for we need to get you tests and stuff did all the tests and they came back a week later and they were like yeah 
type 1 diabetes. And I was like, What's great. the difference in type? Technically, there's type 1 and type 2, mm -hmm. but then you also have gestational, I think, is what it's called, which is basically catching diabetes through being pregnant. Okay. Yeah. A lot of pregnant women can get diabetes and then it goes again once they've like given birth. So it's like it goes away. After. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a pancreatic stress, I guess. Okay. So type two is where the pancreas doesn't work as well as it should, but it still secretes insulin into mm. the body. Um, and you can manage that with a tablet, diet, sometimes insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, type one, the pancreas just doesn't function at all. So every bit of carbs every every carb you eat turns into sugar eventually so you have to count your carbs mm -hmm. then inject insulin to counteract those carbs mm -hmm. so that your body doesn't cannibalize itself which is what happens if your blood sugar levels are too high for too long mm -hmm. you end up with something called ketoacidosis which i've had twice which is horrific it doesn't even sound will good. kill you no it's basically acidic blood due to the fact that you have too much sugar in your system and your body goes we don't know how to do deal with this your, yeah. your blood turns acidic and your body starts cannibalizing yourself mm. it's horrible so yeah i got that uh just as i was starting drama school and i was in the hospital every weekend just because i didn't know i didn't know what i was doing mm. i had no idea what i was doing and i was being told different things from different doctors it was like well, you can't eat this you can't eat this mm -hmm. you should be eating this but you shouldn't be eating this and then it was like well you can eat whatever you want as long as you take the insulin for it yeah and then it was like yeah but now the insulin dose is different and that's it i mean that's changing for me constantly now mm. um i'm very lucky now because i'm on the i'm now on the insulin pod which is an automatic thing mm -hmm. and uh the sensor back then it was finger pricking and pens. How, like, so how, how much did, did like technology changed since like you know when you were diagnosed and now is it like completely different yeah. world yeah. yeah completely different world i even when i was at school i remember a friend had diabetes and she would use syringes with a little vial of insulin and do it that way and it's cool. like, that's gnarly yeah 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 And then when I got it, they were like, cool, there's these pens that you have to click per unit and you count and do all your ratios and, yeah, yeah. and you inject it. But you, you have to finger prick every, yeah. like, every, something, something like every hour or every three hours or something like that. Yeah, your fingertips by the end of it are gnarly every yeah. week. You're like, I'm losing sensitivity in my fingertips, which is also a thing of diabetes. So you're really not helping that by <laughs> pricking it constantly. All right. Um, and it wasn't until last year when I nearly died from taking too much insulin by accident for the amount of pizza I was eating. Pizza is a known enemy of diabetes. Uh, just it's because- It's a, no, a known enemy of, of, of like anyone who wants to eat healthy. Basically. But it's so nice. But it's so, so good. good. So you took too much insulin? I took one unit too many, right? And I had a sensor. So the sensor you could- uh, You could explode it. <laughs> well, not quite, but it did break. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can, you scan it with your phone. Yeah, and it, it comes up with your readings, so you don't have to put your finger anymore. It's great, and you, yeah. you you kind of move that around and you change it and things. Um, and yeah, I took one too many units. Staying at my mate's house, mm. went to bed. My sensor broke overnight. Didn't mm. have a spare one. Didn't realize. Mm. So therefore, when my blood sugars dropped low and I went into a hyperglycemic attack, I didn't wake up because I didn't realize. And I woke up on my friend's living room floor, blood covered in sweat, whole whole body was freezing, but on fire, it was like agony. And I was like, what the hell? There was four paramedics stood over me. Mm -hmm. My mate's in the corner of the room in his underwear, just being like, this is like 6.30 in the morning. What yeah. the fuck is going on? And I couldn't speak. That was the weird thing. And I was really confused. So I was like, okay, it must be something to do with my diabetes. But yeah. I was talking and it sounded like I'd had a stroke. I was like, talking like, Bleh. and I was like, oh, Oh, something's not okay here. Like, I was terrified. So the paramedics so were like... something's not okay. What was your first hint? Yeah, All right. right? Waking up covered in blood. I was like, what the hell happened? So basically what happened Wait, was... Blood as well. Happened. Blood, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the bit that confused me. I was like, hang on a minute. Why is there blood? Yeah. So what happened was my friend had heard me making weird noises from the spare room. All right. And he was like, I'm just going to go check. Opened the door and apparently I was full on exorcist, arched back like all muscles tense like this. And I was just like groaning. On the ceiling. On the ceiling, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, and I was just like, Ugh. and I couldn't talk, I couldn't. And then I started having convulsions. Yeah. And I basically started seizing. 
uh, which I've never, that's never happened to me. I've never had a hypo like that before. Any, I, right. I don't even remember it, but this is what he was saying. So he called paramedics. I then tried to make my way from the spare room into the living room. I must have been trying to find sweets or something. I don't know. It was just confusion. So mm. I was just moving. Paramedics turned up. I'm now by this point just seizing on the floor. And they tried to get a cannula in uh, to... Well, they, they first tried to feed me glucose, but my jaw was locked so tight they couldn't get it into my mouth. Mm -hmm. So then they were like, right, we're going to have to get it into a cannula. So they tried putting the cannula in, but where I was fitting, they had to have three of them hold me down while one of them was trying to get it in, hence the blood everywhere, because I was just flailing my arm around uncontrollably. Um, <laughs> once they got the glucose in my system, I then slowly started to come around and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And once I was awake enough, I was like, how do you feel? And I was like, I feel awful. Like, I feel like terrible. And they were like, well, we're not surprised. Uh, yeah. You're lucky your friend was here. Because uh, they said if uh, if he hadn't called the paramedics or if he hadn't been there, I had 30 minutes before I'd have been in a coma and an hour before I'd been dead. Oh. And I sat there and I was like, huh, okay, right. Like, I've had scares before. I've had moments before. But you always, well, I personally was always like, yeah, it's fine. Oh, mm -hmm. these things happen people yeah. go through these things you deal with it whatever but this one was different this one kind of this one hit me hard later that night I had a breakdown about it and I was like what is going on and I had this weird sense of loss mm -hmm. which was really strange and I think it's because in my head I, I quite like to believe in things like you know multiverse theories or mm. like you know all these different theories of life and so I like to any anything that can't be disproven in mm. science you know it means that it's potentially real so yeah, I'm like, well, of course. Like disprove it yeah. so let's you know mm. it's an exciting it's thing it's still a possibility it's still a possibility yeah. exactly but that for the one thing that kept going through my head was a version of me didn't make it mm -hmm. there's a version of me that didn't survive that mm -hmm. and I was like what if one day I'm the version that doesn't survive it and I was like fuck that's that's I don't like that it's deep yeah so Got in contact with my team that night and I just sent them an email and I was like, look, this has happened. I'm not okay. I need to speak to somebody. And they were mm. like, cool. Come in tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. I was like, oh, thank you. So I went in and they're like, okay, cool. We're going to get you lined up for the insulin pod, which is a little box that has insulin in it. No more pens. It's linked up to a little controller, like a second phone. Mm -hmm. uh, you input the carbs that you're going to eat and it constantly drip feeds you insulin and it boosts every time you need to eat. So basically, you, but you need to tell it like what do you- If I'm eating, eat? yeah. I need to tell it what it's doing. But okay. if my blood sugars naturally do this, it mm. will regulate itself. Mm -hmm. And each time you put a new pod in, like every three days, you have to yeah, replace yeah, them. Yeah. It's got an adaptive AI in it. So it learns your patterns mm -hmm. from each pod. It can constantly be kind of learning what you're doing and yeah, keeping yeah. you regulated. That's where we want AI. Exactly. Yeah. That's where we want AI. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. AI is, you know, they can remove trash from the sea. They don't, they don't need to be screenwriters. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that plus a new sensor and it, it revolutionized my diabetes. Mm. It was insane. Yeah, All right. It's been mad. Mm. All right. Um, but coming back to you going to Egypt second time. Mm, yeah. So I went out second time. Had a blast, absolutely incredible time, met some lifelong friends and just had an amazing time living away from home and doing what I love doing. It was mm. like, this is great. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah, got sent back home because I lost so much weight and I was really unhealthy due to the diabetes. So I came home, got all that sorted. Then tried to get in contact with my agent and was like, yeah, are we like, what's what's going on? Mm. And I got through to uh, an assistant who said, Oh, he passed away. Ooh. And I was like, oh, nobody told me. And I'd found out from somebody else that I worked with who also was on their books. Yeah. They didn't know either. They were like, oh, I didn't, wait, I didn't know he's dead. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, apparently. So we're now no longer repped by anyone. Okay. Um, so yeah, everybody just kind of disappeared off the books. Mm. Uh, I believe the agency's still going, they're run by somebody, in fact, I know they are, because they're, they're run by one of my friends now, uh, or somebody I know, um, and doing very well. Then life happened, I basically gave up acting. I was like, yeah, uh, I came home, didn't get anything for a while, and I was like, you know what, I don't know what to do. Mm. So I went into bartending. 
and I mm-hmm. worked for TJ Fridays as a bartender. Mm-hmm. And I'd worked as a bartender, but I went back in and I was like, no, I'm gonna, this, uh, you know, I'm gonna really go for this. And mm-hmm. I, I, I did. I went. Um, I was part of the team that set the world record for the amount of bartenders flaring. So the juggling with the bottle mm-hmm. tin in full synchronicity for two minutes without dropping a bottle or a tin. Oh, really? Did that in Covent Garden. As cheesy as it sounds, the bar was my stage. I could be mm-hmm. a version of me and be like, yeah, I'm good at this. And I thought at one point, maybe this would be this this could be my career. I could be a mm-hmm. mixologist. And I was given the freedom in the restaurant I was working with uh, in Bath to experiment a lot with recipes we were creating our own stuff all the time me and my bar team and it was we just had so much fun it got to a point my manager jim uh who i have a lot to thank for he sat me down and he went what do you want to do mm. what do you want to do and i was like i want to be an actor yeah but i think i've missed it mm. and he was like Mm-mm, you haven't he said but look you either need to do one of two things he said you either need to become an actor or you train as a manager Mm-hmm. TJ Fridays. Yeah, you can do both. Yeah. Came in two days later, handed him a letter, and he went, oh, for fuck's sake, I didn't mean for you to resign. <laughs> and I was like, well, look. <laughs> you started You it. started this. <laughs> I'm going to London. And he was like, I'm proud of you, man. And I was like, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, kind of then decided in 2018 to get back into acting mm-hmm. and moved to London uh, after working with Be At One for a bit as well trying to kind of, you know, up my cocktail game. And I was like, okay, this is great. I'll move to London. I can start bartending and stuff mm. whilst I'm training. So I went to Identity, mm-hmm. um, did the did a year there part-time. To tell me more about your experience in Identity in general, like what, like what would you say to people who are thinking about going there now? I have no idea what it's like now. Uh, when, w- w- so 2018, I went. I think I was there 20. I was there 18, 19. I, was, I think I was 17. I started training with Lee Lomas at Working Actors Studio. Did you train uh, with Lee at Identity? Uh, yes, it was like the end of the year. Uh, so I did like, I think a year there. Uh, and I had Lee there for like two weeks probably. <laughs> so okay. Like and then he started his own basically school. Mm. And then I kind of started training with, with him. But I, I joined Lee's classes when he just, it was like, well, when he just started. Oh, no. So that was earlier than me then. I think that... I you, think I started in 19. So maybe you're 17, 18 then. I think, yeah. I think I I, fin- I stopped identity at 17 and I started Lee's class at eight, 18. And I'm still kind of doing it. So what, what was your experience with identity? My experience with identity was an interesting one. Um, I learned... I mean, it, it's weird because it can really depend on who your teachers are mm-hmm. massively as to your experience yeah. because obviously every every clan like everything's different the thing with that i found was the lack of structure they're so regimented with you know you can't be late more than these amount of mm-hmm. times you can't miss x amount of classes mm-hmm. um if you're two minutes late you can't get in the class. And it's like, cool, yeah, you set all these rules and boundaries. Yeah. This is great. It's really good. It feels really, yeah. you know, solid. But then when you do a term of voice work focused on breathing, mm-hmm. which is what we did in my first term, second term, they merged two of our classes. Mm. So we did another term of voice and they went, okay, so what did you all learn last, last term? Half of us were like, oh, we did voice work. The other half went, oh, we never did a voice class. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go back to basics, new breathing. So I was like, great. So I'm paying for two terms of learning to breathe. And basically which, like the, exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. Which, I mean, like you need to work on some things yeah. times and times and times and times. But at the same time, like when you learn something and you can do it by yourself, you don't need to go you through need everything. You to learn it again. again. You just yeah. need to practice it. Yeah, it depends on, on who you have as a teacher, I think. Uh, because a couple of the teachers, I don't even remember their names. Yeah. But then obviously there were teachers like Lee, Andrew, who I really connected with. Then it came to the showcase. And the showcase, we I, we did Bull by Mike Bartlett. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was in the cockpit, I think. In the round, great fun. Directed, uh, Canadian director, Matthew, I cannot remember his last name. Mm-hmm. I apologize. Um, and at the end of it, we got assessed. And I got my feedback back saying, 
yeah, we didn't really see much from you. Could have done more. We're going to keep you in. <laughs> Dog's just eating. That's what you can hear. <laughs> it's, it's the porcelain. I know. Uh, he's moving his dish around. He's, <laughs> he'll inhale it. It'll be done in a minute. Um, uh, yeah. So we're going to keep you in intermediate class. Mm-hmm. And I was a bit like, mm-hmm. okay, there are people that are moving up who, yes, probably deserve to, but yeah. I felt a bit like I was like, okay, I've already trained. I've already done that. I don't really know why I would stay in intermediate. It felt like I was being kept there to pay the bills and keep the lights on, essentially, yeah. which a lot of people did feel like. But my director turned to me and said, what's your plans now? And I went, I have no idea. Mm. You know, I'm in my 30s now. I don't really know if yeah. that's yeah, right yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. And he turned around and went, don't. Don't come back. Mm-hmm. He was like, you need to go out and learn in the real world now. You need to get mm-hmm. real world experience. You yeah. Get out and put it into practice. All right. So, yeah, as much as it worked for me, there were moments where I was a bit like, oh, I just don't think I'm getting yeah. as much out of this as other people were. Yeah, for me, identity was, um, I think it was kind of the same. Because mm. I remember that uh, the lack of structure... Uh, I had screen acting for two, what, two or four weeks in a year, like whole kind of year, <laughs> basically. Yeah, it's like, it, it's, it's not some enough. people were learning really cool stuff and other people yeah. were learning, like, yeah, I, d- yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, and, and another thing that I, like, I don't think that the system, when you kind of almost have like an, an exam in the end of term, to define if you go up or you stay in the same, but I don't think it actually worked properly because... It, it doesn't necessarily, like one small performance doesn't necessarily show your skill. No, 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 no. Like how many people have done a show or like a, how many self tapes have you done mm. where you're like, well, that was crap. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then you like- You can't be switched on on 100% every single time. It doesn't, and Tom Hanks probably never gives a perfect performance every time. Do you know what I mean? It's, like, yeah. it's not possible. And at the same time, because like, I know that my, my, my teachers, like at least one of the times, uh, my teacher was insisting on me going up when the like I don't remember who was it, uh, Adi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he like he thought like I need to stay in the same same level. My teacher was like, no, he actually needs to go up, and I was kind of like, it's not like I I got a lot from from identity. I think mm. I went through like a lot of good classes, uh, nice teachers, but at the same time, I, I thought the same. I thought like, it's time for me to get out uh, to find another class, maybe cheaper workshops. Yeah, workshops, classes. And at the same time, I need to look for an agent. I need to kind of start doing things as yeah. well, not just like waiting here. Like, and then also, you know, it, it was pretty hard to do. Like I was you know, full time job and everything. So uh, but yeah, yeah, I think I think that's like it's a very similar experience to a lot of people who I spoke about, like about identity. But I think they changed a lot because it's it's been a long time ago. I have no idea how it, how it's now. I don't know either. Yeah. I haven't spoken to anyone who goes there anymore. But I, I yeah, I do remember a lot of people that were there when we were there have very similar experiences mm. to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also just don't think that system of tier level works in mm-hmm. something like acting because it's very any any sort of art is fully based on opinion and sub like it's subjective mm. yes there is such a thing as a bad actor mm. or such or, no i mean like there are technical the, things that are part of of craft of the craft, of the craft. Yeah, yeah 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 and there's a lot of stuff that you can't teach as well you know um but i think that I think that's why I preferred, because the, the thing that I really took from it was these two teachers, Andrew and Lee, mm-hmm. I was like, I can learn a lot from both of them. Mm-hmm. And then Lee started his own class and I was like, okay, yeah. now I can go and learn from Lee. And that's what I took from it was that different teachers can teach you different things. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be in an institution mm-hmm. to learn from everybody when it comes to acting, especially if you've already trained. Mm-hmm. If you're using it like a, a refresher, which is what I did. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad I went. I don't regret it at all. No, mm. Not at all. It was, it was sure. great. And I you know, met a lot of people through it that I still keep in contact with now. Because at the end of the day, what is acting if it's not just you know collaboration? It's, especially if you're not working constantly, you're like, well, 
you know, I one need, of to, the most I need amazing to collaborate. Things, one of the most amazing things I think about acting, like, because, the, you know, the, like, there's a lot of rumors about, like, oh, there's so much drama in acting. They all kind of hate. No, the thing is, like, the community of actors is, well, like, it's one of the tightest. Like, you, I, I met so many friends in last like few years when I actually was doing classes, like in comparison to basically years of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you yep. met so many like amazing people who just like do like someone can, you know, tap dance and, and also sing and everything. Someone can barely walk. <laughs> But we, we still find each other. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, we let's use tap dancing loosely because I've not done that for many years. My feet are screwed now, so there's no way they're going to do that. Um, but yeah, I, on that thing mm -hmm. about the drama thing, it's something I've noticed going from musical theatre into straight acting, screen acting theatre stuff. Um, musical theatre is bitchy as fuck. Really? Yeah, I used to hate auditioning for musical theatre. I don't know if it's different now. It probably isn't because it's been that way for years. But I remember going into an audition room and instantly everybody eyeing you up, being like, who are you? What can you do? Mm -hmm. you're, in, you're my competition. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go to a commercial audition or you go to a, uh, you know, a screen audition, anything, you're sat in a room with people who you look like. You're sat there with, mm -hmm. like, chances are you're going to be sat in a room with 20 other people who you're like... Mm -hmm. Oh, gee, I'm in a room of clones. Like, obviously, you're all individual, but you yeah. all have something that they have asked mm. of that person, of that character, that, you know, whatever look they need. Yeah. And so you realize, actually, none of you are really my competition. It doesn't come down to who's better. It comes down to who is right for mm. the role, mm -hmm. normally, usually. Yeah. And so yeah. there's, I find there's a lot less competitiveness in stage and screen mm -hmm. as opposed to musical theatre, mm. especially with the auditions. You, mm. you sit and you talk to people in musical theatre auditions and they're all like, all the conversation is, it's leading questions that they don't care about the answer of. Mm -hmm. It's so that they can answer their own question and tell you what they've done nine times out of ten. You know, oh, where did you train? Why, what the fuck does that matter where I mm. trained? I trained over 10 years ago. Like yeah. you don't know it. You've not heard of it. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so you trained at Lipper. I don't give a shit. Yeah. I, it's a name. It's somewhere you train. Like that mm. whole thing of coming out of drama school and everyone was like, oh, you know, you go into big West End shows and you open up a book and it's filled with Talia Conti, Italia, Italia Conti, Italia Conti. And you're like, oh, you have to be from one of these big name drama schools mm. to get anywhere. It's just not, it's stupid. Mm. Like, it's such a stupid thing to be like, well, your pedigree must dictate your talent. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's not, it's how much you, it's, it's about who, what you can take from different teachers, you know? And I also believe that you shouldn't, you shouldn't stay with a teacher for longer than you need to. Yeah. Everybody in this world can only teach you so much. There's only so much knowledge in my brain that I can yeah. impart on somebody. No, Einstein, I mean, Einstein can only teach people so much about physics and all that. Eventually, you'd probably go, okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. I've learned everything I can from you. Now I'm going to go to Stephen Hawking and learn more. No, I think... I or think, different things. Uh, I think it's true, partially true. But at the same time, I think like when you keep working with someone, like it doesn't... like you might be learning something in the process together. Like mm. you can, oh, yeah. it's not like, well, I kind of drained your knowledge and now I know everything. No, you kind of like when oh, you right. work together with someone, like it's almost like a gym as well. Like you kind of like, it's it's not like the trainer that teach you everything, like taught you, taught you everything. <laughs> not like a trainer taught you everything. Like you kind of train together with him, with them and you kind of can learn and build on what you built yesterday. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, I do. I, I was I was once told that getting into a class mindset mm -hmm. of just constantly doing classes and workshops is really detrimental to your mm. career because you're constantly striving to be better when actually you're not putting any of it into practice. Um, even down to creating your own stuff, mm -hmm. you know, just having that. It, it, it can breed a mindset of, well, I'm not, I'm not good enough yet. Mm -hmm. I need to keep training. I need to keep yeah. learning. I need to do more before I'm ready. And that is yeah. a big, 
that's a big thing. I think I think that's that's a big thing for a lot of actors who are not like you know practicing working actors like mm. actors who just struggle, which is like ninety percent. Ninety percent. Yeah, it's <laughs> no more. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's just basically not like believing in yourself. Which it sounds so cheesy, but it's like it's it's true. Like believing in yourself, believing that you are ready, knowing that you did the job, knowing that you like constantly performing like we did like with in the working actor studio, like you every week you learn a script, every week you perform, every week you get some uh, some kind of uh, feedback and then you can see your progress. But you can see your progress only when you actually look back on your previous like two, three years old tapes, and then yeah. you can see your progress. Otherwise, it's like it's it's just gradual, like it's gradually. Same as going to the gym. Yeah, and you don't even understand it. But then at some point, like you need to realize, guys, if you're doing acting, you need to realize at some point that you are ready. You need to just you need believe to that jump. and do that. Yeah, you might make mistakes. You, you like will. you don't you know will everything, make mistakes. but you just have to believe in that because I kind of like I I know well, that I need to remind myself. My last year was very very quiet. I had like one tiny acting job with just like in this BBC Ghost. Uh, it was just one line. One tiny acting job. On TV with one line. It's more than I've had. <sighs> it... <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I mean. But this is what I mean. It's yeah, like, but you know. It was, it was just one line, very kind of not my casting. Well, I mean, like, Caveman is a, my casting time. <laughs> <laughs> you, looked, you looked right. You looked right. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so, but like, I didn't have a lot of auditions as well, probably because of all the strikes, right? The strike, actor strike, like, yeah, the quite, industry was quite kind of like very quiet. Yeah. So it wasn't a great year. So when you more, like, most of the time when you perform, in class and you don't work as an actor like you have to remind yourself that like i'm not an acting student i am an actor who's practicing their craft in a different way work at the moment yeah, yeah exactly exactly I'm, I'm doing a workshop at the moment on saturdays and it's mm -hmm. like okay cool uh i've had a couple of i've had a few auditions this year so far which is great considering it's still january mm -hmm. i'm like excellent um and I've got my, I'm, I'm now taking this year to work on my own projects. Um, you know, that whole adage of mm. don't wait to be told yes, do your yeah. own shit. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, cool. All right. But again, comes down to belief. I've had this, I've had these projects ready to go for like yeah, two, three years, if not longer, some of them. Yeah. And it's now that I'm like, I can do this. Mm -hmm. what, what was I waiting for before? Was I waiting for approval from other people mm -hmm. to read the script and go, this is great. Was I waiting for money to come in to be able to do it? And it's like, I, that's never going to happen, Matt. You know, I'm like, I don't work a nine to five. I'm very lucky. I'm very, very, very lucky and very blessed to be living with family in London mm -hmm. and therefore able to not work a nine to five, two, three jobs to pay for rent, mm -hmm. plus being an actor. Like some yeah. of my friends, they work two, three jobs. They then don't have time for auditions. So yeah, I'm very lucky to be in the situation that I am where I can work. I mean, I, I am working, but I'm, I'm working in immersive, the immersive industry. There is another question I wanted to, so like, mm. uh, yeah, after identity. You so identity 2018 till 19. You started training with Lee and then, yep. correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but then after uh, identity, you, did you go to Japan? I did. Working in you, uh, you, what, you Universal Studios? Universal Studios, Studios. yeah. So okay. I got my second agent yeah. uh, after identity. Uh, which just so happened, again, going back to the agent thing, this was just a flute. Uh, my girlfriend at the time had an agent and they were looking for men in their 30s who looked younger. And I was yeah. like, well, that's me. Yeah. Uh, so I met up with them. They, they were like, yeah, great, cool, come on board. I was like, cool, mm -hmm. okay. Then I saw the Universal Studios Japan World Tour was starting, which is what they call their uh, yeah, audition yeah, yeah. process. And I was like, hey, can you let me know when this comes through to London? Because I'm not going to remember. I'll forget. Mm -hmm. and they're like, yeah, absolutely. So they put me forward for it. I was number 523. Uh, I had to sing Shut Up and Dance With Me mm. by shoot, uh, Walk the Moon, Shoot the Moon. Um, I, I sang that. And I, I also saw on the email that, that they sent, if you were over six foot and you are a baritone bass, Mm -hmm. familiarize yourself with Santana Smooth because you will be auditioned for the role of Frankenstein. 
I was like, okay, cool. They gave me this. They gave me the sheet music for Smooth. They were like, come back in an hour. Mm. I was like, cool, no worries. I was like, I already know it, so I'm just gonna go and chill for mm. an hour. So went and chilled, came back, did Smooth in a group audition. Um, then they were like, okay, cool. Those of you who we'd like to stay, come mm. back for the dance audition. Mm. And that was in two hours time. Okay, cool. So I'll wait around, do that, uh, do the dance audition, which I'm not. I was like, okay, just smile and look confident. You're mm. gonna be fine. <laughs> and I was paired with this guy, James, who I actually ended up working with. He was actually in my cast in Japan, mm. in my show. Uh, and he was a dancer. And I was like, fuck, like, he's really good and I'm not. And I was like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> anyway, did it. And then they were like, okay, we'd like to see you for the interview. Turned into like an 11 hour audition in the end. It was insane. Oh, really? Yeah. And this was in February. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, so this is the first stop on the tour of auditions. We'll let you know by October. Mm. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like... <laughs> February to October. It's like, all right. All right. I'll yeah. just, I'll just forget about this then. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. do the usual, do the audition, do your best, come out and go, yeah, cool, did that. Now forget about it. And if mm. I get it, I get it. If I don't, I'm not thinking about it. It's fine. Yeah. So I went away. October comes around, I get an email saying, hey, we would like you to, uh, we'd like to offer you a place. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize at the time that what happens is at the end of each contract, they offer places to people at the park yeah. who they want to stay on for another year. Yeah. If they say no, or if anybody gets fired then or gets sent home, get early, someone in. then they get someone in. So in February, I was auditioning for Frankenstein, just general audition. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to actually being offered the job, there's a chance that they might not need anyone. Mm -hmm. So it's not even whether you were right for the job or not, it's whether they actually need anybody for the position. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Luckily for me, somebody had been fired and somebody else wasn't coming back. Mm -hmm. So I got an email along with one other guy and bearing in mind they do London, I think they do Man, no, it's only, it's only London in the UK and they might do Scotland. Mm. Then they do Australia, they mm. do like three or four stops in Australia and then they do three or four states in America. Yeah. And out of all the, and I was 523. The, was it like a musical or like a theater performance? Was it like, yeah, was like so just the a show, big show with... So the show I was in was the Rock and Roll Monster Show. Uh, Monsters Live, it's called. Um, and basically it's, I mean, it's insane. It was insane. I've never seen anything like it because, or I've never performed anywhere yeah. like it. Because this stage is a Broadway sized stage. It is massive. And it's covered in set that looks like a graveyard. There's this giant clock tower. Mm. Uh, there's um, there's loads of different layers Is and levels. Is this kind of like an attraction park? Universal or? Universal, yeah, it's the theme park, yeah. yeah. But uh, Universal are known for their shows. They do a lot yeah. of shows, especially, I think, I think all of them do, actually. Mm. I've only ever been to the one in Japan. I've never yeah. been to yeah. any of the others. Um, but yeah, and it was, the, the show is essentially Beetlejuice throws a party in the graveyard. And Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, uh, the werewolf or Wolfie, um, and Drac, and then these two ch undead cheerleaders, Hip and Hop, who are basically the dancers. Mm. They just have this party in the graveyard and they just sing rock and roll songs and dance. And it was great. And me being Frankenstein meant I didn't have to dance. So mm. I was like, this is brilliant. Cause I had a, I was holding a guitar. I had to mind playing the guitar at these, boots, platform boots that were like this high off the ground, um, big prosthetic head, green makeup, purple like pleather suit. But I was the skinniest and shortest Frankenstein they'd ever had, I think. Because mm. the other guys who were playing Frank were like six foot five built as well, yeah. very muscular guys. And I was like, this is awkward. Luckily the guy, the guy was like, yeah, you were hired for your voice. I was like, yeah. well, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> I'm like, it's good that I wasn't hired for my look as Frankenstein, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that was great. I was there for 13 months and that was insane. Nice. I had the time of my life and I was there during the pandemic. First of all, like what was, describe me your day. Like what was your day like? How often did you perform per, per week? Mm -hmm. uh, what was a day like? How often did you have to like rehearse? Did you have free time to go out and, you know, be wild and watch yeah. all the anime? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So rehearsal started basically the day after we landed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fuck jet lag, you just straight in. Yeah. It's like, here we go. Uh, and that was 10 
10, 12 hour days, long days of, of yeah. rehearsals, dance calls, singing, the lot. And it, it, you'd start with singing, then finish with dance in the afternoon or mm -hmm. the night. Or you'd do a full day of singing, then do a few weeks of dance and what have you, trying to get all the choreography ready. Then a couple of weeks before you debut the show, obviously there's another team doing the shows as well. So you're in an off-site unit, basically, in a studio mm -hmm. rehearsing. Then during the days, you'd come in first thing in the morning or late at night in the actual theater and do dress runs, perform and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very technical. You've got to be in a lot of different places. It's not just the, it's not just the choreography and the singing you've got to remember. You've got to be uh, in your positions backstage and like Dracula comes down from the ceiling at one point. And so he's got to run up like five, six flights of stairs, get rigged up at the top in time after the last song to get up there and then drop down for his song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to like sprint off stage and then run downstairs to get to uh, a basement elevator that mm. shoots you up through the stage, through yeah. pyrotechnics for my song. And, so, and it's like, there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts involved. Um, but in terms of then when we debuted, uh, <laughs> funnily, I actually debuted my show and then the next day we were in doing notes and they were like, right, everybody go home, everybody back to your, back to your flat. And we were like, what? And they were like, parks closed until further notice. Uh, and that was pandemic. And we were like, fuck. Cause we went out there right at the beginning of it. We went to, we, we stopped at Hong Kong airport on the way yeah. there and everybody was masked up. There wasn't much distancing happening mm -hmm. at this point cause no one knew what it was, but it felt very apocalyptic everywhere. Yeah, it was yeah, a bit yeah. like, oh, this is weird. And people were just generally a bit scared and a bit mm -hmm. on edge. Uh, yeah, so then three weeks later, three or four weeks later, we just, yeah, we shut the park down. But while we were working, because it was a weird one, obviously it was a bit different compared to what it would have been every other year. But mm -hmm. in terms of a weekly basis, when we reopened the park and when we were back, we would work, you'd get a day and a half off. Um, in terms of shows, you would do anywhere between one and five shows a day. How, how many how many Frankenstein's did you like? How many people so did you we, have per per role? Yeah, so there were four Frank. There were four Franks, four teams, I think. Yeah. Well, no, three teams plus a swing. Mm -hmm. So you'd have three different casts. Yeah. Plus then an extra person for swinging on each role. The group performs as a group uh, all the time. Yeah. Time, like, yeah. Or you occasionally, could yeah, occasionally you'd be mixed up if mm -hmm. if somebody was ill or yeah. if somebody had booked the day off or they'd swap days with other people. Mm -hmm. You'd occasionally work with other people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you would yeah you'd have your three casts. Your predominant cast. Mine was Kendra, Darcy, uh, James, and then the twins Tiana and Lindsay, and me. And then Taka was our Beetlejuice. The Beetlejuices were, Jap were Japanese. Mm. Everybody else was Western performers. It was yeah. either British, American, or Australian. And we all lived together in one big block of flats. It was like 108 of us mm -hmm. in a block of flats. So mm. when it came to pandemic and lockdown, which Japan didn't really do because yeah. they wanted to do the Olympics still, uh, <laughs> they were like, ah, there's, there's no... What are you talking about? There's no COVID here. Yeah. Like, what? What are you talking yeah, about? It's, it's, they're in China. It's yeah, it's, yeah. It's fine. Um, no, we're not going to test anyone for it either. Don't be ridiculous. It was, <laughs> there was a lot of that going on. Um, but yeah, so you do you do between one to kind of five shows a day, um, depending on how busy it was and depending on how many people were in that day. And the show's like forty five minutes long, I think. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, a decent kind of time for a, a show to happen in a, a theme park, you know? Mm. And then, yeah, you'd get, you'd get, it was either one and a half or two days. It might've been two days off, but they weren't always back to back and they weren't, you know, yeah. they, they would move around a lot, which was, which was nice. Cause it meant you could do different things. So how long, how long were you rehearsing before you started uh, performing? So I think it was, uh, I think it was like two, it was either two or three weeks. Two or three weeks. And then when you started performances, did you still rehearse before you performed? The or not? Yeah, the yeah. first kind of month of performances we would do, uh, we'd perform, then we'd have notes, yeah. feedback, we'd be brought in for, you know, making sure everything was tight. Mm -hmm. They were really, really on that. Yeah, thing. Yeah, like, yeah, right, your, your, your arm is slightly here, whereas yeah. that person's arm is here. We need to fix that. And it's, yeah. you know, the level of, of, uh, choreography and things is, is great. I mean, they get world-class people in to, to uh, be the MD and the mm. choreographer as well. I mean, I, I, I'm not big in my choreography world or dancers, yeah. but I know some of the dancers were very like, oh, that's that's Michelle Sharman. Like, oh my God, she's worked with 
X, Y, Z. And mm. I was like, I, I don't know. She's a lovely, lovely choreographer. But when mm. I first got there, I was like, I don't know who this is. However, the MD uh, was the MD for Postmodern Jukebox, who for me, I was like, holy crap. Mm. I was like, I love Postmodern Jukebox. Mm. Like, this guy is like one of my heroes. And yeah. like, I got to work with him. And yeah. it was insane. That for me was wild. I was like, oh my God. But yeah, aside from the lockdown and pandemic having a bit of an effect with travel, so yeah. like, I wanted to go to Fuji, I wanted to go to Tokyo, but when it got round to actually going there, it just so happened I had tickets to go to Disney Sea in Tokyo and take mm. a long weekend in Tokyo. Yeah. And then uh, we got travel restrictions put on. No, I, was like, yeah. I was like, it's been fine this entire time and mm. now you're putting a travel restriction. Uh, but I did get to go to Kyoto. I saw the bamboo forest in the snow. I climbed mm. Mount Arashiyama, saw the macaques and mm. it was just, yeah, it was phenomenal. We were in Osaka, which food mm. capital of Japan. It was, yeah, All getting right. ramen 24 hours. Oh. A ramen at like 3 a.m. You'd be like, yeah, oh. let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. It was yeah. great. It was yeah, great. It sounds, sounds yeah. great. What, like, what? What's Japan like? <laughs> Japan's incredible. Yeah. 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 The people are so, so welcoming, so mm. hospitable. They will go out of their way to make yeah. sure that you are comfortable. Mm. You know, um, everything is about respect. Yeah. Everything is, you know, um, the work ethic is interesting. Yeah. Western performers were treated with very much a, oh, no, it's okay. Don't worry. That's fine. <laughs> Oh, you messed that? That's all right. Don't worry. Just don't do it. Just don't do it again. Yeah. You're like, okay. Japanese performers were, what the fuck was that? It was like tore into if they yeah. were slightly off. It was like, really? ah, and they would be rehearsing day in, day out while the rest of us are like, oh, all right, cool. I'll, I'll work on that for an hour and then I'll yeah, really? go to the bar. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Japan is very much a, a country that is, there, there was a saying we had and it was, because Japan. Yeah. <laughs> And it was like, why, 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 why is this done like this? Because Japan. Makes sense. And it's like, you know, this is the way they've done it forever. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Why change it? And yeah. you're like, okay, but things like their banking systems haven't changed in 20 years. Yeah. Like online banking was an absolute nightmare. You have to have a stamp uh, for like a little pay book thing it was I, I didn't understand it you had to go to the bank with a with a little stamp and if you didn't have the stamp you couldn't get money and it was like what it was, it was weird but yes yeah, things like that were like uh, that's, i don't that's weird because I, 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 I always thought that like japan is very very technically advanced advanced yeah they have holographic shopping tills so that you don't have to press anything you just point at the hologram no. self-service checkouts with holograms man really yeah Yeah, yeah, and you just you just go and you're like, cool. You don't have to actually touch anything. Oh my okay. uh, god. but uh, where where are you well taken care of there? Yes. Yeah. So like uh, you were paid uh by the way, if it's not a secret, how much mm. did, did they pay? It was it was enough that had I been sensible with my money, <laughs> I could have come home and I like put a deposit on a house sort of thing. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. basically, like, while while you live there, like, I think I came home with fifteen thousand. All right. Which is fifteen thousand five hundred more than I went out there with. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but I did I did spend a lot of money traveling and experiencing because I was I was planning on staying for two years. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, but then because of the pandemic, they were like, we need to cut the costs in half. And at that yeah. point, I was like, well, I'm not staying because I'm skinny and short and I'm I've got type 1 diabetes yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the insurance is going to go up every year that I'm there so and basically so while, while you will uh, you were living there uh, so the stay was paid right like the, you didn't have bed and board yeah well bed you get you get your own flat yeah which is like it's a west they call it a western room a mm -hmm. western flat so it's not like a, a Japanese style uh, mm -hmm. accommodation So it was like one room, it was like a student kind of apartment. We, we were always out and about and mm. they were big enough to have friends around. So when we were yeah. locked down, we were allowed a maximum of 10 people in our rooms. Well, yeah. I was like, dude, I can't fit 10 people yeah. in my room. But like <laughs> five people comfortably. Yeah. I had my own bar in there that I'd set up and stuff. Mm. And like I had my PlayStation, my yeah. Switch, my laptop. And, uh, and then you have the, the little kind of kitchenette and then a toilet with a wet room attached that yeah. had a huge tub. The first bathtub, as a six foot one person, a bathtub big enough for me 
to sit in with enough room at the end for my feet. There was like this much room at the end of the bath <laughs> and I'd be up to my neck and it was so deep that's, that you could just have the water really overflowing as well because it was a wet room. So you were just like, this is fun. This <laughs> is amazing. It sounds great. <laughs> yes. I, I don't have that here. <laughs> no. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, did, they, did they feed you as well? Uh, so we did have like on-site cafeteria and stuff mm -hmm. like that um, that was super cheap, mm -hmm. super, super cheap. Um, but Japan for eating in general, I mean, Japan is expensive to live if you're not working there. Mm -hmm. But like I said, we got, we got our flats covered. We had a, a ticket for the train, which was our official route to work was mm -hmm. the train, but it mm -hmm. was double the length of the ferry. Yeah. So the ferry you would cycle. We all got given bikes as well mm -hmm. because it's the best way to get around. You'd cycle for like five minutes from the accommodation to the ferry, mm -hmm. but the ferry would only run certain times. And also, if the, it was a tiny little like chug boat thing, like this mm -hmm. little go, 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 go. And if the wind was too high or whatever, it wouldn't run. Or if the weather was too bad, it wouldn't run. Sometimes yeah. it would break down in the middle of the river and drift off towards Hawaii, and you'd be like, great, where the fuck are we going now? <laughs> so they were like, look. The ferry isn't reliable enough to be your official route. So if you were late from the ferry, it was your own fault. So mm. they gave you a free train ticket, which went further than work as well. So you could get to Kyoto, I think, for free mm. and back. Um, or at least definitely to Dotonbori, which is like the big shopping kind of capital, mm. of, uh, the, the center bit of, of Osaka. And yeah, so the, all that was covered, all that was paid for. Um, you had your Wi-Fi, you also had a Japanese phone for work purposes, mm -hmm. which I thought I was being clever and I linked my Wi-Fi from the phone to my phone. Yeah. <laughs> and then after the first month, they were like, uh, you got a bill of 20,000 yen. And I was like, how much is it? It's like 200 bill? quid. All right. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it's uh, 2,000 yen. I was like, I'm sorry, what? They were like, yeah, that's for your Wi-Fi. And I was like, oh, fuck. They were like, you linked it to your phone, didn't you? And I went, yeah. They were like, you're not the first. You won't be the last but you owe us money. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, I won't, I won't do that again. I was like, thanks for warning me before, Anne. Uh, well, it, it, it seemed like a, such a smart and original idea. Yeah, exactly. I was like, no one's ever done this before, right? <laughs> and no, I've never heard anybody get in trouble from it, so I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> There's no trouble, you just yeah, spend just, money. Yeah, I'm spending money, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, so, and there were so many supermarkets, there's so many street food mm. sender, like sellers and stuff that you just... I rarely cooked for myself. And if I did, I mean, I was buying Wagyu, Wagyu steaks yeah. for like a fiver in the supermarket or tuna, tuna steaks, which were like this thick, yeah. this long for like a tenner. Really? And you're just like, and it's all fresh. And it's all, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Wagyu is that top stuff that they're selling there because it's their beef. They, yeah. they I'll export. About that. <laughs> well, this is it. They export like most stuff, but. Mm they keep the good stuff for themselves. You get a slab of Wagyu like this, and it's just almost white with marbling. You, mm. And I was like, this cost me like 15 pounds. Here, you're looking like 80 quid. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's insane. Yeah. So I was eating good, I was eating good. The, the most expensive thing out there is probably fruit. Mm. Fruit is insane out there. You, really? you could buy a melon, a watermelon, for 500 pounds. They, they, they give fruit as retirement gifts. Because the, the melons are, there was, there was a honeydew melon that I saw. And I was like, that looks, it looked really good. And I was mm. like, this looks really good. And one of my friends was saying that basically they're grown on farms. It's one melon per plant. They remove all the other melons from the plant. So one melon gets all the nutrients. They're under a little sunshade to stop them from getting like bleached or whatever. Yeah. And they get massaged daily by workers wearing silk gloves. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? No, oh, come on. They were like, yep, they massage them to get all them, like, to get them, like, get all the juices and everything. I was like, this is insane, but it was the most amazing tasting fruit I've ever had in my yeah. life. I was like, yeah, I, I spent a, a bit of money on, like, grapes and things, and I was like, I need to stop buying fruit, man. <laughs> Interesting thing. You know, you know grape flavoring? No. So, like, if you have, like, a grape soda yeah, 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 or whatever, yeah. you're like, it tastes like fake grape. It doesn't taste like grape. No. Right? I bought some grapes in Japan took a bite and I was like, wait, this tastes like fake grape. Yeah. Which really confused me because then I was like, hang on, fake grape is not fake grape. It's this grape, whatever the 
this grape is. Yeah. Which is a real grape, which means my entire life, this weird fake flavoring is actually real. And I've only just discovered now in my 30s because I'm in Japan eating expensive grapes. It was so strange, but I've never tasted anything anywhere else. And I was like, I don't like them because it tastes like fake grape. <laughs> I was like, great. No, this is very, it's very. No, this is the grape. And I'm like, no. No, it's not. This is weird. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, and you had some time to like to go around. Did you go like to some clubs or any, like anything like that? Or? Uh, we did go to a club. We shouldn't have done. We went on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Uh, we were told we weren't allowed out on New Year's Eve because it was locked down still. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Japan's like... lockdown was don't go out unless you have to. Yeah. So it's New Year's Eve. Exactly. Police weren't, you know, they weren't like strict on clubs mm. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. by that point, people were kind of going out and about. The only thing that we were in risk of was getting in trouble with work. Yeah, so New Year's, New Year's, uh, was it like 2018, to, like, uh, 2019 to No, 2020 into 2021. Oh, okay, so yeah, it was like already kind of full. Yeah, it was in full swing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like by then, I was, um, that was 20, 20 kilos heavier than I was uh, a year before that. Because <laughs> I spent all, all year sitting in my ass, on my ass in my room eating burgers this is it this is the weird myself, yeah. this is the weird thing like i don't have any of that trauma from mm. from the lockdowns that yeah. people in the uk do or and other countries it was like i'm still living in the but kind of in like in the world mentally that like i'm still waiting for everything to come back to normal even though kind of everything is it, back to normal it but is. I'm it's just not. a new yeah yeah, yeah. I'm not Which, I'm, I'm just completely in a world like that I forgot how to communicate to people if every time yeah. when I need to go out like and even like when people tell me like come on come on come, good boy come on and I was like yeah I need to go out I want to see people but at the same time I need to push myself out like it's really hard for me to get out from, from, from my flat now just when I'm out I'm happy I'm like oh Thank God I see I see growing up people and I can yeah. talk to them. It's just getting to that point. But yeah, it's, it's honestly it's hard. Like and then I need to recharge longer. Mm. Because I always was kind of like I thought I'm an extrovert. At least I thought so. But now I feel like I'm like when I'm out, I'm an extrovert, but then I need to recharge for a lo longer time than before. I don't know. It's, it's just it's it's a weird, weird new world now for me. Mm. Like I'm I don't know. I'm feel, I'm still feeling very anxious about so many things. But anyways. <laughs> no, it's interesting because somebody said to me uh, last year, they were like, yeah, I find it odd that we don't, we can't share that. Mm. We can't share the experience of having lockdown yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, I get it because it were, I, I don't get it because I wasn't here for it. Mm. But I get that it was such a huge thing for everybody that it is, yeah. you know. Uh, so yeah, that was that was an odd thing coming back because I came back yeah. right at the end of the last lockdown mm. in the UK. So I came back, had to quarantine for a week mm -hmm. because Japan wasn't on the red list anymore. Mm -hmm. So I came back, quarantined for a week. And then as I came out, everybody else was coming out. And I was like, mm. I've completely missed all of the all of the kind of lockdown and everything. It was yes. really odd. And because we were locked down in a, in a building of 108 people, when we were locked down, we were still able to see each other because we were yeah. just in the same building. So it was like, wow. Well, oh, man, no, for me, it was a very different experience because when, uh, when uh, I was working, uh, as a designer, when the lockdown happened, I'm like, I'm renting a room. Mm. So I kind of like, uh, when I stopped going to the office, first month or so was all right. But then I was basically like sleeping in that room, working in that room, resting in that room, eating in that room. Mm. And like that room be became my cell. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. Like, uh, thank God my, my kids uh, were living like very close to me. So I could, I could go and like see them a couple of times a week. But still, it was like, it was very hard because at some point I realized, like, I, f I forgot how to talk to people. Mm. If I, like, I had my morning calls every morning for work, it was like 15 minutes a day. And then for the whole day, uh, the only times when I was basically talking during the day was me talking to myself out loud which i do a lot now. i do that anyway and like yeah. I, I did that before as well but like not as often i think not because now i just like i would just kind of i I, f I forgot how to speak at some point like when i came back to to the acting class my addiction went way down because i was working on my addiction for like for a while and i could kind of get you know for me it's like <laughs> getting better getting worse getting better getting worse and then i came back to the class and I'm like i forgot how to move my you know this thing doesn't yeah. work 
I don't use it. I don't yeah, use yeah. it at all. And it was like I got I got so depressed. I had no idea I was depressed. Honestly, I thought like it's just like yeah, it's uh, everybody's going through this. Everybody, yeah. And, yeah, and it's then, like mm. then I stepped on you know on, on scales and I'm like oh my god, I went from 101 kilos in probably nine to 12 months. I went to 122. Right. I got. That. <laughs> I got fat. I was just basically, and I'm still kind of fighting it because I was uh, last year. I was doing boxing, yeah, mm. like since last February, uh, just boxing for fitness. It's not yeah, yeah, boxing yeah. for fighting. I do like some, you know, sparring, but li- very light sparring. And still, like in a year, I lost ten kilos. There is another ten <laughs> I need to lose. Like I said, man, you're looking good. Part. You're looking good. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Uh, you too. all right and i think so basically when you came back to uh, london Mm. from japan that's when you came to least class when he actually started having classes again yeah i think i think that's when that's when we properly met because before that before that like we've seen each other maybe on tapes or like maybe in class just yeah just kind of passing by or going to see shows and stuff yeah yeah and since then basically we kind of became uh pretty Close friends. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Mm. And that's kind of almost it. And yeah, this last kind of three years has been re I mean, for me, it's been interesting. This last three years is what I would class as me. When people say, oh, how long have you been an actor for? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, from the age of eight until, you know, 33, mm-hmm. I always would say, Oh, I'm trying to be an actor. I'm a bartender, but yeah. I'm trying to be an actor. When I got back from Japan, that my whole kind of mindset changed, and I was like, "No, actually, I'm an actor." Yeah. Doesn't matter if I, you know, because then the follow-up question is, "What have I seen you in?" Yeah. And I know a lot of actors go, "I don't tell anyone because you know I hate the conversation." Mm-hmm. I tell people, I, you know, I go to the hospital all the time, health issues, and they're like, "So what do you do?" I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. Oh, have I seen you in anything? Not yet. Mm. And that's it. That's all you have to say because then they don't follow it up with anything. There's no awkward. Mm. Whereas a lot of people can be asked, well, what have I seen you in? And they're like, oh, yeah, nothing yet because I'm a failure. So, and it's like, well, that's not the case. Because also another one of mine is like, well, do you watch much fringe theater? Mm. Do you watch many short films? Mm. Like, yeah, because otherwise you won't have seen me in anything. Mm. I don't know, you might spot me as an extra in the back of something from when I was doing extra work, but like, mm. you know, now I'm like, you haven't seen me in anything yet, but you will, mm. but I am an actor. But that mm. that really only started in the last kind of three years. Mm. And it really only kind of took off from coming back to Japan and then doing workshops, really getting back into it, finding my way and... When, when someone, you know, like even when I kind of with friends and I meet someone else and my friends like, yeah, Andre is also an actor. I, I kind of straight away went and like go into this like oh, self-defense. Stop, oh, stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is nothing, to, <laughs> there's nothing to prove that I am. Like there are some, you know, bits and scenes, like some, some scenes. So kind of like short film like this and that, but nothing that I'm kind of really kind of like, yeah, well, you can. It's on Netflix. You can watch it. No. <laughs> you see, this is it. This is it. This is this is something I learned uh, just over the past kind of few years is that there is a huge difference between success and fame. Mm-hmm. They're not one and the same. No, but, but uh, no, I... And you can be a successful actor and nobody know who you are. No, I agree You're with that. You're constantly just working and stuff, which I know neither of us are doing, but yeah. like... You want to be a, a working actor. Yeah. Like... That's yeah. I don't, I don't. I don't need fame. I don't want yeah. fame. I just want to earn a living and mm. be comfortable doing what I love, mm. which I think is equally as hard. In fact, I think it's harder than fame mm. to attain. Yeah. I think fame nowadays, fame is easy to attain and random and sporadic and I guess, not yeah. necessarily earned most yeah. of the time. With the rise of you know like reality TV mm. stars, TikTok, or mm. you, you know YouTubers, things mm. like that. It's like whereas. Success as an actor is earned and also, it's also luck as well, you know, it's to be seen, to be given the opportunity to then work constantly. Mm. It's, you know, you have to get that one director to see you yeah. who then goes, I like you, I want to work with you. Mm. And then you get the, you know, the Tim Burton, Helena Bonham Carter situation where you work with them yeah. on a few projects and then someone else sees you and it's just, you just need that to get 
ball rolling. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, but again, like it's it's uh, it's a hard mental exercise. It is. It is. Me, it, just... A lot of it is mental. A lot of it is all mm. how you view yourself, how you view success, how you view how you compare yourself to other people as well, which is a big mm -hmm. thing. That even if you don't compare yourself, even if you're trying not to compare yourself mm. to others, you'll eventually always do it. Yeah, of course. And it's a really difficult thing to kind of break that habit. But that's a really big one is, okay, well, I'm me, I'm different to everybody else. Yeah, fine, I might be in a room with five other people going for the same role because we've all got the same casting type. Mm. We're all skinny white guys with floppy hair. It's like, yeah, fine, but like, you know, <laughs> there is there, there is an individuality to each of you. Mm. That That is the thing that, it's that 30 seconds in the room. Mm. You know, it's the first 30 seconds in the room that defines you from everybody else. Mm. And that could be before you've even opened your mouth. Yeah. The second you walk through that door, somebody's gonna go, that energy, that look, perfect. Mm. Can he deliver? Yeah, great, yeah. even better. All right, look, you know what? Like, uh, I have a few more questions. Cool. First one, how do you prepare for the role? Hmm. What's your process? How do I prepare for a role? Uh, so I will obviously read the script first, familiarize myself with how, uh, familiarize myself with where the character's been, what the, what the journey is to this point, the precipitating circumstances, uh, what their goal is, their overarching kind of goal, um, and what they want from each scene, each person. Um, but honestly, I tend not to kind of get too caught up on that. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, I don't know. They, I basically look at it and I go, right, what situation am I in? What's the what's the what's the character doing? What are they saying? How are they reacting? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the words are there. The words are being you know the words are just words. It, it, it's literally anything on a paper. What it is is there is only so much prep you can do before you get in front of somebody because acting is reacting. As cliche as that is, yeah. you know I I could be I could learn the words inside out, know exactly how I want to say them, what mm -hmm. I want to do. But the second I sit down in front of you as an actor, we're doing a scene together, if I give you what I want to give you as I've rehearsed it... Without looking at what I'm giving to you. Yeah, exactly. All I'm doing is talking at you. Yeah. I'm performing to you. Yeah. When actually what, you, what I do is make sure you're 100% on the lines, mm -hmm. make sure you know what your kind of general goals are, mm -hmm. and then just listen mm -hmm. and respond. Yeah. And that way, every time you do it should be different. Yeah, I I agree with you on that because uh, it's just it's it's like uh, to be fair, like very very fair comparison. I think like to the fight, like as Mike Tyson said, like you mm. can have a great plan, but until someone punches you in the face, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. Here, like it's the same here, but like it's not a fight. But like when I'm with a partner, like and I decide like I'll deliver the line like this, and then I keep doing it when the partner gives me something else then it's just like uh well your plan is you're not reacting yeah yeah you're not reacting to each other you're not listening to each other so a lot of it comes down to in the moment mm -hmm. of being like yeah i mean obviously with stage you have you rehearse everything you rehearse yeah. the blocking but you're, still it's still but even every still time. you need to but that's the thing with stage you need to be able to keep it fresh mm -hmm. each performance every night yeah you need to be able to go back in and be like tonight's a new performance mm -hmm. and actually and a lot of times you can not not in terms of energy, but in terms of how you're feeling, you can bring that to the character. Mm -hmm. Maybe the character's got a cold, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, did a, I did a show, the, I did a, a performance of The Sea Between, mm -hmm. and I think I was like, I think I just come out of hospital or something, and I, or like I was ill or something, and I was just like, I'm just gonna use it. It's just gonna be the character for today. As long as the energy is there, yeah. you can still be sick, but with energy. It's like, just fucking I just agree. do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that then informs how the other person is then going to react to you being like, well, you're sick uh, or you're, you know, you're feeling a little lethargic today or you've got, you know, you, mm. you're a bit more emotional than normal. It's like, cool, well, that's going to inform how the scene plays out. But the, the general goals all end up the same. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in terms of preparing, I just make sure that I know my shit and I make sure that I'm... The, the, the number one thing you need to prepare is just knowing your lines, mm -hmm. I think, personally. Because if you're thinking about the lines, 
Yeah, it's... You're out of what this is. Completely. The second you think mm. of anything yeah. is the second you lose it. It's the second you think not about your partner, not like, you know, actually putting all attention on your partner, trying to actually achieve something Affect and looking, them. yeah. It, like, as soon as you think, I need to be in the moment, you're not in the moment. You're not in the moment. No, <laughs> Straight no, away. no. And that's different to, because uh, I, I had it once where I thought about what I was about to eat for dinner, mm -hmm. mid-show. Yeah. And afterwards I was like, idiot, idiot. But my director was like, that was the best you've ever performed that scene. And I was like, what? I was like, I was completely not there. Mm -hmm. I was listening, I was thinking about mm -hmm. dinner. And he was like, but what do you do in real life yeah. when you're talking to somebody? Sometimes you will just, your mind will just yeah. wander and be like, yeah. oh, there's a bluebird outside. Yeah, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. shit, sorry, okay, yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking. And he was like, it was just so natural. And it's mm. because you weren't, thi I wasn't thinking about the situation. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about the theater. I wasn't thinking but, about the like, audience. What, what you were doing at that moment, even though it wasn't in the moment, but it was real, rather than trying to tr trying to be real in the moment as an actor. Like yeah. the, you were a human being who was thinking about something real and you looked real in the moment, which, which is like, it's, it's a very, it's very so, weird, you can't right? it's so, it's so difficult to explain <laughs> yeah. that, you know, and be like, well, that's, yeah. yeah. The, the moment you think about being in the moment mm -hmm. is the moment you're not in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the moment that the audience go, ah, you're not in it. Yeah. I can see you're not in it. All right. Uh, what was your most challenging role up to date? Frankenstein was difficult in terms of technically technicality. Yeah. Yeah, we did the we did a Halloween show which was outside and it was a dance show. Mm -hmm. And us boys as Franks, we were like, we can't do half this choreography because we're wearing these six mm -hmm. kilo boots. Mm -hmm. It's like this is impossible. Um, and I actually remember being in a rehearsal with uh, my best mate Josh, who was a Dracula. And I can't remember if it was the Halloween or the Christmas show. I think it was the Halloween show. But basically, we're, we're dancing in a room, wearing masks mm. because of COVID. So you're like suffocating whilst dancing. It was like, oh my God, this is difficult. Uh, but I was grateful for the, the mask because it was hiding the fact that I was having a full-blown panic attack in the middle of this choreography rehearsal. I had tears streaming down my face. My mask was here. Oh. I lifted it. And I was just like, breathe, just breathe. Just keep going, just keep going. But I was like... I have full imposter syndrome. I was like, I shouldn't be here. Someone's going to realize I shouldn't be here and I'm going to get sent home. Like, I can't dance. This is insane. Even, even the non-dancers are doing better than I am. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And it, we, we went for a break and I literally just went straight to the, headed for the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And I was in the corner of the bathroom, just crying in, the, in these toilets. And my mate came in and was like, dude, I was here last year. It's fine. Like, yeah. you've got this. You're doing so well. And he talked me out and I was like, no, you're right. I can do this. I'm here. I've got this far. I'm in Japan. Mm. Like, I, I wouldn't be here if they didn't see something. Yeah. Anymore. So that was very technically difficult for me, especially with dyspraxia and stuff. Yeah. It takes me just a lot longer to learn choreography than most yeah. people. Once I had it, I was like, fuck yeah, I'm proud of mm. myself. I'm doing this. Mm. Uh, in terms of getting into a character or having a character that is far removed from me, Mike in C Between, written by Demi. That was probably I, as much fun as I had with it. Mm -hmm. He was an asshole and he yeah. was, you know, yeah. but he had to start the play loving and confident and kind and then finish it as this gaslighting, manipulative, abusive yeah. person. And I'm like, that's a big shift in an hour to try and convey. Yeah, and, and I've seen it, I've seen it three times. Uh, yeah, I was about to say, yeah, we've done like, we've done like three, three different versions. iterations of it. Yeah, and you've seen yeah, it every see single time. All yeah. three. And I got to say, like, because, yeah, in the very beginning, like, and even like in the middle, there are moments when you kind of like, you kind of, you actually like the guy. You That's like it. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then there are sometimes there are moments when you kind of think about like, well, he's kind of right in some situations, but then it like crosses all the lines. And you're like, completely. oh, no. like, oh. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I see it. Yeah, yeah. And that... I mean, not only was that a challenge being a, a two-hander, my first two-hander that I'd ever done, so mm. a full 97-page mm. two-hander script, I think. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, that in itself was a challenge, mm. but then trying to find those layers of why is he like this? Mm. Why is he abusive yet? Why is he still with her if he clearly mm -hmm. doesn't enjoy yeah. being with her? It's yeah. like, so yeah, but in terms of the toughest... Uh, project probably had to be Healing Andy, which we've only just finished, mm. which, 
you might see at some point. I really I don't hope know. so. I fucking hope, <laughs> I hope so we'll too. <laughs> Shot over a year, so I hope someone's <laughs> going to see it. Uh, that was gnarly. Yeah, that was insane. Who inspires you? Present, Who inspires past, me? I don't know, like the icons in in acting world, or maybe just, you know, some people mm. in, in the world who motivate you and who inspire you? Uh, Brian Cranston is a massive hero of mine. I met him once mm -hmm. when he came to do the network at the National Theatre here mm -hmm. in London. Me and a friend, Curtis, we were in a, we were in the National writing a short film <laughs> together just randomly. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, network's on. Should we go see if there's tickets? I was like, yeah, cool. Absolutely phenomenal performance. But then they were like, he's also doing a Q&A and it's a pound for students. There's, there's seats left, you want to go? And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So we sat there in the auditorium and we're watching it and he was talking about his book, which I was reading at the time, um, A Life in Parts. And he sat there and he said, who here wants to be an actor? Obviously half the auditorium put their hands up. He's mm -hmm. like, who wants to be famous? And a few people put their hands down and mm -hmm. he was like, the few people in this room that just put their hands down are more likely to make it than anyone else. Because mm -hmm. his father had chased fame and it had ruined his life apparently, mm -hmm. like lost his family and lost his career and just basically ruined him. Um, and that was the moment that I was like, yeah, I don't want, I don't want fame actually. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to be chased by paparazzi. Mm -hmm. I don't want, I don't want, I want, I want success. I want to do what I love doing and have a comfortable life. And then I met him in afterwards, he was doing a book signing mm -hmm. and I went over with my book and he, he signed it and we had a bit of a chat and he was like, Keep going. Mm. He was like, keep going. You'll get it. Nice. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I will, actually. You're right. That and, and his book in general, I was like, this is just amazing. It's, mm. You know, he started really late in life with Malcolm in the Middle. He'd mm. done, he's had a whole life of random jobs. He, he was a pilot for a bit. He was like, he uh, mm. was a, uh, he was officiated to be able to, to perform wedding ceremonies mm. and stuff. And I was like, wow, yeah, I can kind of, relate to this mm. quite a bit. I've had really weird back and forth life. Um, and then my uncle, Martin, mm. my dad's brother. Uh, well, I'm my mum's brother, Martin, actually, both of them. Very much so. They're very, both very different people, but uh, my dad's brother, Martin, he's a freelance tuba player. Mm. And he always told me, never turn down a free job, unless it's detrimental to your health or your career. Mm -hmm. Never turn down a free job mm -hmm. because you never know who's going to see it, who's going to be there, who yeah. you're going to work with. Yeah. Which is why even... I, I love doing student films mm -hmm. now because one of them could be the next Kubrick. Mm -hmm. One of them could be the next Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, you build a relationship with these people mm -hmm. and then they're like, I had this one actor back when I was, when I was at film school to bring them in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you never know where any of this is going to mm -hmm. go. And also it's just great experience just being on set. You know, yeah. there's no such thing as bad art. I mean, there is, there is, <laughs> there, there is, is but, but you can learn a lot. It's experience on the set doesn't matter if it's student film or it's like full on big production. No, it's like sometimes you actually get more experience on small sets because, yeah, you because you're closer to the action you, you have to do. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I agree. Yeah, I love I doing indie products. It. Yeah, exactly. I've learned so much from just doing indie projects and, and student projects and stuff. But yeah, my uh, we call him Big Uncle Martin and, and Little Uncle Martin because <laughs> <laughs> obviously they're both mine. Mm. One is quite tall and the other one's quite short. Mm. Uh, so yeah, my, uh, my, my dad's brother, Martin, the, the tuba player, he, he really inspired me to, to keep going in that kind of industry. Cause he'll mm. say he was a musician and, and all the rest of it. He still is. Um, and then my little uncle Martin, who's 10 years older than me, and he's almost like a big brother to me. I don't have any older siblings mm -hmm. than the eldest, but he's like a big brother to me. And he used to look after us as kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're really close. Um, but he's always believed in me always believed in me mm -hmm. um, and he's always supported me and he's always been there like me and my parents are very close but we've I'm I don't know we're not a family that talk about things mm -hmm. if there's any kind of issues and stuff we don't we tend to just kind of deal with them ourselves or with our external partners and stuff yeah but yeah my uh, little uncle mine he's he's guided me a lot through problems in life those I think those three and obviously my parents, you know, without them, I wouldn't be here without them. Mm. And without their work ethic, I don't think I'd be where I am either without their determination and without their belief and trust and faith in me and stuff. So, yeah. mm. All right. Mm. Do you think actors were narcissists? Yeah. Yeah. 
hundred percent for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you have to be a little bit at least. Um, it's whether or not you rein it, you learn to rein it in. Mm. You know, because um, I know some actors who are heavy narcissists, mm. which breeds delusion. I mean, there, I'm sure there are famous people or successful people who are also narcissists. Mm. But yeah, I think I think we're all a bit narcissistic. I think we have to be because you have to have you have to believe in yourself mm. enough. And so to have that self-belief, you have to have a moment of, yeah, I'm fucking good, mm. you know? I mean, for me, it's not even like, um, believing that you're good is one thing. It's about wanting to be seen because we're putting ourselves deliberately in front of a lot of people. We definitely want that kind of applause mm. and things, but then it's, it's also finding the balance of, look at me and I want to affect you. I do believe, like, probably, yeah, if I chose this profession, it's something that I want to do. Like, there, is, there should be something, in, like, narcissistic in, in there. But I want to be good in it, rather than wanting to be... I'm not doing it for the narcissism. Yeah, I kind of, like, it is narcissism, but in narcissism, not in a way, like, look at me. I'm more in a way, like, I really want to be good and you to appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I think comes down to any sort of craft or, you know, something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. You know, it can, it can it can even be cooking. Yeah. You know, when you're cooking for other people, it's like, yeah, well, I want to be good at this, but I want you to enjoy what yeah. I'm making, I what I'm doing myself. for you. Things you know, okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, oh. I, I love cooking. Yeah, I love I'm pretty cooking. good at cooking, but I never cook for myself. Oh, really? I, I mean, like, very rarely, I kind of like something very simple. Yeah. But when I'm cooking for someone, I spend so much effort, so much time. I'm yep. just trying I'll do like a three make... course meal, and I'm like, please, please, just, I, I want you to enjoy this, yeah. which, is all, it, which is the same as creating a piece of art. It's creating mm. a, a play or a film. You're like, I want you to enjoy this, yeah. but it just so happens that I want to be in it because I love doing it. Yeah. And there is then a side of, yeah, I want you to come and tell me it's good, please. Yeah. But we, but, do, we, we do want to prove. We do, yeah. We, we absolutely want to prove it. Well, people say, like, I'm not doing it. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about art. It's They're about, lying. It's, like, it's just like, it might be, no, maybe it's true. It's about art as well, but it's also about you. You, the, can't, yeah. you can't choose the profession and think about, like, it's not about me. It is. Like, no, it you is. You put yourself in the position of, you You're know. You're putting yourself in front of an audience or a camera. It is about you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even if that is a small, small part of it, it's mm -hmm. still about you. Mm -hmm. You still want that approval and that validation and to mm -hmm. be seen by people, you know. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Like, we're, we're all definitely nuts. We had an amazing conversation. I almost didn't look at my phone with all the questions because <laughs> I had like... shit about I, my life. <laughs> no, 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 but that, that was great because I, I had like almost like 40 questions uh, written down just in case we don't have anything to talk about <laughs> because I decided I need to be over prepared. Yeah, uh, no, that's good, that's good. I really hope that next time when we meet, and I hope we'll do it again, mm -hmm. we'll talk more about the, the other questions that I have. But uh, there are a couple more things that I want to talk to you about. So cool. first one, first one, what's next for you now? Do you think, do you, do you have anything in the pipeline? Yes, so, uh, as you saw, I wrote a scratch piece called Swings and Roundabouts for yeah. a... Uh, uh, I've seen a, a you, snippet of it. You saw it, yeah, the 15 minute piece. Yeah. Uh, well, the cast loved it so much they wanted to do it again. So yeah. I've, re I've tweaked it. We've recast one of the roles uh, just for the sake of the kind of going forward. It, mm -hmm. it just kind of works differently. Uh, I've written an extra character in. So we're putting that on. That's on the 19th of Feb uh, at Theatre in the Pound at the cockpit, which mm -hmm. is a great workshop thing where you basically do a scratch and there's yeah. a Q&A afterwards. Are there tickets Audience already paid. available? Yep, yep, right. tickets are out. Uh, so the, the link will be in the description. Tickets are a pound and it's great to give, I say, as audience feedback afterwards. So I get to ask questions of the audience and the audience get to then give me feedback. So for me, this is a, a way for me to streamline because I'd love to write a full play based around it. Yeah. So that's my immediate kind of project. Uh, we, we start work on that next week, I think. I, yeah, so that's my directorial debut, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and the cast are great. Then uh, I've got a few little bits and pieces lined up from last year, a couple of shorts. So yeah, that's that's the kind of definitive thing that's in the pipeline. Hopefully shooting my first short film in the summer. Um, but yeah, this year this year I'm taking time to get my own shit out there. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. It's been it's been long enough that it's all been in the pipeline for a while. It's now just getting that thing of being like, yeah. 
I can do this. Mm. Why shouldn't I? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Blizz round. Mm. And uh, I think it will be accompanied by the click clacking of like yeah. a dog walking around, but it's it's fine. Let, let's let's go through it. Okay. Texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Even though this one's <laughs> annoying the hell out of me. I still love you. Uh, your one guilty pleasure. My one guilty pleasure? Video games. All right. We'll talk about video games next time. I really wanted to talk to you about video games, oh, but know. next time we will yeah. talk more about video games and all this other stuff. Yeah. Uh, what makes you laugh? Goofiness. What makes you angry? Slow walkers. Oh, yes, man. Uh, do you have any nicknames? Uh, Matt, Womble. <laughs> we'll get into that one next time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't actually. <laughs> Bristol guy. That's that's one of the ones that work. Yeah, They're like, awesome. you know, Bristol Matt. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what dish do you cook best? Risotto. All right, nice. Your favorite character in any fiction story, book, screen, video game? Uh, oh, um, Mass Effect trilogy, and it's uh, uh, I've now blanked because it's quite Shepard. No, 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 not Shepard. Um, the, the, the mercenary with the, the sniper rifle. Uh, I don't know. I never played it, to be fair. Oh, my God. <laughs> my favorite trilogy. Uh, let's talk about the other two trilogies. Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Ooh. You have to choose one. It's a controversial one. The original Star Wars. Okay. That's only because that came first for me. Star Wars <laughs> came first for me. Lord of the Rings was later. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? I can tie a cherry uh, stem in a knot with my tongue. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll no trust hands. you. That's me as a bartender. <laughs> uh, when was the last time you cried? Two days ago. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I was watching. I was watching a TV show. And it, it, yeah, I'm a very emotional person. I wear my heart on my sleeve. So lots of, I, I love a good cry as well. Mm. Sometimes I'll do like a self-forgiveness meditation if yeah. I need it. And I just weep and it's fucking great. The last one I did was, uh, it was just over Christmas. I had a really, not a depressing Christmas, but it was just different. Um, and I was like, you know what? I need to have a, I need to have a cleanse. Mm. And I just cried and it was mm. so good. I just felt so fresh and light the next day. Mm. It was great. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Uh, I'm on Instagram as MK Actor, uh, K A Y. Uh, I'm on Twitter as MK Actor, <laughs> three M's, K A Y. Okay. Uh, and that's probably the two best way. Probably Instagram more than Twitter. I don't really right. use Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called nowadays. Yeah, or through my agent, going across. All right. And the very last thing is something that I asked you yesterday is a segment called One Cool Thing that I stole from another podcast called yep. Script Notes with uh, uh, Craig Mason and John August. Uh, something that you discovered, maybe recently, but maybe not recently, something that you really like and you think that our listeners or you know viewers will like. Yes. And they should try it. So it's this. I bought this recently. I discovered this recently. It's called The Last Lecture by Randy Pausch. Mm -hmm. It is a book written by Randy. Quick summary, this guy had pancreatic cancer and was going to do a last lecture at Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. um, they do this anyway for all lecturers. They're like, you know, if you could give one last lecture, what would mm -hmm. it be about? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And he got asked to do it, then found out he had terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. Decided to do it anyway. It literally was his last lecture, but he did it in a way that it was for his kids because his kids were too young to remember him mm -hmm. after he passed. So he was like, this is my chance to teach them mm -hmm. everything I know as they grow older mm -hmm. through a lecture. And then it was turned into a book by him and his friend, uh, Jeffrey Zaslow. And yeah, it's just a, it's a collection of memories, stories through life. And it's beautiful. It's funny. It'll make you think. It'll make you cry. I think everybody should read it. Yeah. Honestly, it's great and it's filled with lessons. And it, there, there's there's some chapters that I was reading and I was like, it just sparked memories in my mind of childhood mm. that I'd completely forgotten. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, I used to do this. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's beautiful. So yeah, The Last Lecture mm. by Randy Pausch. Nice. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. I apologize to his friends and family if that's <laughs> not it. But yes, very, very, very good book. Thanks, man. It was beautiful and you know what let's let's show the should we get the pooches on yeah, yeah, just let's... toffee ah, there he is this is toffee yeah the corgi and that is treacle 
Yeah. And there's a little facet cross with a collie, I believe. Yeah. They were clicking and clacking all that time. All that entire time. All the time. But you know what? I think I think we went through it. Yeah. I think it was fine. I really enjoyed it. I had, I had that was so nice. It was really nice to see you again, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, it's been ages. It's been ages. Let's do it soon again. All yes, right. That's for sure. time for me to run. Yes, go feed your kids. <laughs>